So welcome everyone for a wonderful discussion today on, uh, on a very, not a very easy subject to address. You know, ways to significantly improve the economy of West Bengal. You know, all of us have spent significant time on site of West Bengal also. And we've heard, uh, you know, lots of different uh, challenges uh, which exist and uh, uh, how the state went from being one of the top most states in the country in the 1960s and then uh, has been on a downward trajectory since. So reversing this trend is a very, very difficult task. Uh, I'll say a little bit of background, you know, just by saying that Bengal is one of the few, I think this is a drawing from the lovely note which Ambassador Chakravarti wrote about our uh, discussion today, that Bengal is one of the few states, you know, which has been blessed with a lot of resources. You know, we have mineral resources, we have fantastic climate, we have fertile land, great connectivity, sea, air, land, uh, good education, uh, there's generally, you know, a peaceful <laughs> atmosphere. So all the hard aspects, all the you know, check boxes that you would want, uh, you know, in a state uh, to be able to get onto a fast growth track, you know, all exist in Bengal. Uh, but I think some of the discussion that we will have today will center on addressing the hard aspects in terms of policy, but also the soft aspects, which is one of the major reasons why the state has been criticized and has been the contributor towards brain drain and flight of capital, flight of talent, etc. Uh, you know, addressing things like the work culture and, uh, you know, things of that sort. So, I think it should be a very lively discussion. You know, I'll just start on a slightly humorous note by saying that, you know, uh, you know, one of the uh, challenges in which uh, of the state is embodied by the Kolkata taxi cabs. You know, where they have a habit of saying no to everything. And you can turn that to your advantage. You know, when, you know, you can ask a taxi driver, Vicky Ulta Danda Javi and say no. I'm thinking sorry like Javi Neil said, no. I'm thinking Motalachi, no. And then you take that as a compliment. <laughs> because they say no to everything. So uh, with that, I'll quickly establish the ground rules. Uh, so our discussion today will be under Chatham House rules, which means that anyone who comes to the meeting is free to use the discussion, information in the discussion, but uh, may not reveal who made the comments of the discussion. So this is just designed to increase the openness of discussion. Since there are so many of us, I request each speaker to limit their uh, thoughts to about five minutes each. Uh, we may give precedence to the young students who have uh, joined us today to hear their views. Uh, so we can start with uh, you know their views and then we can go around the table. Uh, we are supposed to end this session by five o'clock. If we have time before that, we can get into a more detailed uh, question and answer session. And if the proceedings are very lively and everyone's still interested in uh, uh, delaying their tea, uh, we could perhaps extend it by a few more minutes. Um, I'll just, before uh, we start uh, with the speaker on my left hand, we'll go around the table. We'll start uh, by the, with the students. And each speaker may kindly introduce themselves very briefly before giving their comments. Uh, just in terms of procedural hygiene, once we complete the proceedings, uh, the speakers and participants are requested to email Ambassador Chakravarti with their uh, you know, with their uh, one or two page note on whatever they've spoken about. What Senna's team will do is compile all of these uh, information into an edited volume without mentioning the writer's uh, name and we will uh, publish that uh, in our uh, journal. So uh, with that, I would like to invite the students to introduce themselves and give their thoughts on our very interesting topic today, today how to revive and uh, uh, improve the economy of our beloved state of West Bengal. The Department of History, University of Calcutta. So uh, the topic itself uh, got me thinking, and I was thinking about it from a lot of perspective as a young student. I, uh, for some time now, since I've been in my fourth semester, I was wondering about the opportunities I have at my hand in for the future. Uh, future, and I want to be in academia. That's what I've been thinking for a while. And when I look at West Bengal, I see the opportunities very bleak for me because had I been living in Delhi or if I had been pursuing my master's at any reputed university in Delhi, I think I would have been interning with any organization for a similar time period and that would have come from within the university. The university would have aided me or I would have the opportunity to work there. But sitting here in uh, Kolkata, I don't think so the opportunities are there at my hand. And these are coming from some personal insights. But while I was uh, reading about the issues, uh, the Telegraph, I am an avid reader of the Telegraph, and it's 21st August uh, 2022 edition, which came on this Sunday, uh, got me thinking on two points. So in West Bengal, there were two industries. 
industries that are functioning, the jute and the tea industry. And, uh, and the two issues that I want to raise are diametrically opposite each other. The first topic that got me thinking was the tea uh, gardens in Darjeeling and the European consortium that is not able to pay the wages properly. And the wages are usually paid within a fortnight or so, but they are not paying the wages for the consecutive three fortnights and it is rather a difficult situation for a landlocked area like North Bengal. And the second topic, uh, you know, I was not about to read that article. I just was browsing through it and the picture caught my attention. And I do have the cuttings of the paper with me today. And the picture was of this woman who was sitting at a factory. And it was about how women are again joining the jute mills right after 1960. You know, 90, uh, since 1960s, women were not working in the jute factories because of the machines that have been introduced. But now what is happening is men are not working in this front because they feel the wages are poor and also they are addicted to alcoholism as well as other addictions. And for women, it is do or die. When they are stepping out of their house, they need a livelihood for themselves. And they, and whatever little amount that they get, 450 rupees a day or even lesser than that, they would readily work in that sphere and that I thought was something very commendable on this front that women are coming up and women are working in these youth industries and as several management books and scholars have spoken about employing women actually secures you know is much more viable because uh, again it is uh, speaking very crudely they work under any circumstances they will you know they uh, they won't care if there is sexual harassment at workplace they'll still work and this article did talk about it but uh, i'm not supporting the idea of working in a factory I'm, I'm sure we have seen the modern times in which uh, charlie chaplin was there and the way in which he was operating those screws and bolts and and that is not the horrors of working in a factory system and these women who are employed in the factory system in these factories they are working round the clock with very little time for themselves so that was horrible, but what was rather empowering about this article, Chodima Bhattacharya wrote the article, was rather that these women are coming up to the work front and I thought uh, that was commendable. But then again, the jute industry doesn't provide a lot of opportunities because the gunny bags, which were the biggest things that jute industry were, uh, you know, uh, producing, those gunny bags do not have the value that in the market that they used to have. So they are not cost effective. But I was speaking to my professor a few days ago about this uh, future of Bengal and she said yes, there are lots of problems in Bengal starting from the, uh, the poor economic opportunities to a lot of problems like the political corruption and there, there, you know, the discussion can go on and on. But what she said was the willpower on the part of people to work. You know, And I think that is what makes this place a viable solution. Of course, the negativities, the negative points can go on and on, but we need to work with what we have. Like, so you mentioned that Bengal has been, uh, it has been resourceful, it has everything that is needed. And I think because it had everything it needed, it never tried hard to work. And I think whatever we have, we need to work with that and build on that. That's, I think, what I want to say. Thank you so much. What was your name again? My name is Nina Kosh. Nina. Thank you, Nina. Uh, I'll ask your colleague now to get there. My name is uh, yes. Shinjori Bosch. I am a um, uh, history student in the modern in the modern history department from Calcutta University. And um, regarding uh, the growth of Bengal, the first thing that is uh, I think that comes very starkly to the view is the economy. And it's a it's an uh, it's an administrative and economic system that I impacts every other department. Uh, and I would like to speak on the educational uh, in the impact on educational department of impact of um, impact on education because of the economy of West Bengal. And um, what I see in many statistics is that West Bengal has uh, lower. Uh, educational statistics it's going down by the day and it's been said that the literacy is going down and the students uh, less number of students are being enrolled and the output of higher education the higher you go up the output of students the output of jobs is lesser in bengal but what i would like to put uh, like put in perspective is from, uh, from personal insights i have not noticed that whenever uh, a family of an engineer or a doctor uh, gets a job or gets in, into an institution outside of Bengal, the family takes pride in it. So even though Kolkata or West Bengal has the opportunities to give a proper education, has the 
proper faculties, we do take pride in moving out, even for the smallest things. For engineers uh, in the West Bengal, the chances are much less to get jobs near uh, cities, and that can be said for any state, but whenever an engineer, much like my father who gets an opportunity outside West Bengal, the rest of the family is proud. But whenever it's in Jamshedpur or in any place in West Bengal that's closer to um, you know, having a better chance of success, uh, we do not look forward to it. And another thing is, as Nina mentioned, that West Bengal needs to work with what we have. And what we have, and I have noticed among youngsters, is that we have a lenient, we have, we bend more towards arts. And when we do, we, uh, we, we are looked down upon by a lot of people. And when we are putting down our strength, that is not, that will not help. I know a lot of people who are very much talented in musical uh, aspects, musical instruments and arts, fine arts. But whenever you say, you tell someone that I'm an artist in West Bengal, oh, you do not have money. But whenever you say I am an artist in Los Angeles or uh, SNU, like Singapore National University, oh, you are doing really great. Whatever the career is, if we are following it in Bengal, it has not been looked at with pride. But if we are doing the same outside Bengal, we look up to it. Maybe because they are paid more outside, but at the same time, the, uh, the, the nurturing begins at the younger stage and it happens in Bengal. And another part uh, I want to emphasize is that another strength that Bengal has, and this came out in the business statistical studies, is the food industry of Bengal is, even though there are phrases that are used uh, looking down upon the food industry as the, you know, like Bengalis are only all about food, but if we actually look at the statistics, Bengal's food industry is one of the best business industries in, in West Bengal and that has the highest profit margins. So we do have some strengths which which can be worked upon and if the same uh, talent is being uh, you know praised in different places why can't the same praise be given to the people who are doing the same in Bengal. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you Hinduji. Is there uh, anyone else? Yeah. Please. Uh, I am Devopio. Uh, I, I completed my master's from uh, Department of International Research at Shahrukh University and recently I have been inducted to the PhD program as well. So uh, basically uh, I had an idea that I was supposed to read it out so I wrote two pages and uh, uh, what I wanted to, what I intend to do today is sort of you know uh, reframe the question and try to also trace that why are we here where we are. I mean, the symptoms are quite clear to us, but then why are we what we are? So I've tentatively titled it as Reframing West Bengal, an unorderly state with a question mark. Very few people seem to realize that nations stand in need of leadership to perish and rot away, no less than to rise and achieve greatness. Where the prophetic words pronounced by the eminent Bengali writer, Hirotsi Chodri, in his famous book, The Autobiography of an Unknown Year, as we witness the painful decline of West Bengal, marked by corruption scandals and petty political squabbles, under the scintillating sun of electronic media, one is rather forced to wonder if even in our perilous descent, we are denied leadership. It is rather a sad state of affairs that the present situation is reflective of a vacuum like no other in the history of the state. Moreover, we are faced with a unique political moment in the country but the tendency to centralize and homogenize based on controversial notions of nationalism is out at play. This is intended with the steady undermining and appropriation of diverse realities of the country, which further gives rise to a chain of reactions now visible in the states of Punjab, Tamil Nadu, and West Bengal. The cost of falling trap to the fierce struggle for identities and what should gain predominance might further catalyze a downward spiral of the state. However, it will be wise to remember the words, men make their own history, but they do not make it under the circumstances of their choice. So while we, may, we must render ourselves fully in asserting our agency in determining history, we can only begin to progress by carefully placing ourselves in the complex metrics of history. 
If you have to discern the decline of West Bengal economy, you cannot but start with the partition of Bengal. This led to the cataclysmic changes in the region, whose effects we are forced to bear eventually. The jute that was largely produced in East Bengal did not find its way to the factories in West Bengal. Or the status that the ports of Valdia and Kolkata enjoyed lost its glory as it found itself in a geographical conundrum. The burden of the surplus population affected by the voluminous influx of partition victims also placed considerable pressure on land, jobs, and resources. Moreover, post independence struck West Bengal with a new form of dereliction when it was subjected to graded treatment. Shuvajit Bhakti argues in his paper, Bengal through the decades, the more, the, uh, the more things change, have to escape the same, question mark, that Bengal bore the burnt of centers vacillating policies, evident in the grants approved for refugees from East Pakistan. Indeed, then, Chief Minister of Bengal, Vidhan Chandra Rao, objected to the changing economic plans of the Nehru government, cited multiple decisions of the center, which he argued squeezed Bengal. The much debated deindustrialization of Bengal, which began in the 60s and went further into the later decades, can partly be attributed to the difficult relationship between the center and the state, if not fully. The change in relationship, however, should not be seen as a mere policy consequence, but the specific outcome of the post-colonial architecture in which Bengal remained the mystery. To put it in other words, the partition of Bengal took place three times. Once in 1874 when Silet was handed over to Assam, in 1905 and finally in the fateful 1947. Bengal's distinct nature and its participation in revolutionary nationalist activities of the time, its emergence as a fully grown subnational identity having a distinct language and literature, created a difficult relationship with the colonial administration. The post-independent period has been symptomatic of this difficulty, although some assuming new forms. The left front rule that led to stagnancy and ossification of economic and social life since the 90s survived for another decade. And it is worth mentioning this feature was a key component for the left's spectacular survival in the new century, in the 21st century. And it is worth mentioning uh, also that the moment of departure of the left was its implementation of the new industrial policy during Buddha Bhattacharya's time, bringing the state closer to the center in terms of its agreement on the new liberal path. However, this also led to their fatal demise as the people decided to vote them out. Professor Nandi uh, had argued that the idiom of the nation first came with ideas of state, ethnicity, citizenship, territoriality, security, etc. But once these were comfortably settled, people tend to more, move towards more pure identities such as Tamil, Sikhs, Gorkas, etc. It would be an overestimation if one argues that a specific undercurrent of subnationalism has been prevalent that tended to remain in distinction from the mainstream as, and has been a key feature of West Bengal ever since. It will be noted by many as one of the components responsible for the peripheralization of West Bengal in the imagination of the center. However, my humble submission is that it also holds the key to the progress of Bengal as one of the forerunners of the Indian Union. A move towards a stronger federalization enabling Bengal for a more independent role can help not only itself but also the entire region. To begin with, West Bengal is one of the unique states which is geographically positions advantages. It shares borders with three countries, Bangladesh, Nepal and Bhutan. It is a gateway to the Northeast India which links it up with the ASEAN countries and China. Therefore, it is incumbent upon policymakers that Bengal plays a stronger role in the implementation of the Lucas policy. Further, it has a well connected river network which was once the li lifeline of undivided Bengal and also opens up to the Bay of Bengal linking it with the rest of the <coughs> world through the sea. However, most importantly, revitalizing relationship bet uh, between Bangladesh and West Bengal is necessary as this will help both the countries to accumulate growth founded upon geographical and historical con continuity. The universities of two Bengals and the expatriate Bengalis that include professional students and businessmen need to be mobilized for initiating joint ventures that will be beneficial for both parties and will help for a sense of unity and strength. It is again my humble sub submission that only when the albatross of constantly putting up a sense of distinctness is relaxed, Bengal can move forward. And in this case, the emergence of Bengal as a strong federal entity can help resolve this contention. 
any move on the contrary trying to steal or object to Bengal's unique trajectory might prove to be catastrophic to the law. Thank you. But it would be very good if we uh, have a vibrant discussion now on moving towards what we can do to you know, activate the economy. So I will let uh, Jenny Kareem please start. Distinguished people, scholars, good job, external service, and of course the armed forces. I feel a little overawed that I'm going to speak about economics being a totally non-economic man. So I'll tear into the economic structure of India, if I may, with a view that then you can look for solutions. So I'll start right from the beginning to what do we see that is wrong. First was the monetization, particularly, which affected our structure drastically. Left people without jobs, without money. I'm just going to run through that quickly with five minutes, it's not a long time. And a lot of people are just... Then the political attitude of relevant parties in creating political strife. Strife between religions and between ethnic groups. That has really left this country bleeding all over. Even more so in the Northeast and in Bengal. And COVID. Again, strict people of employment. No jobs. No jobs, no money. On top of everything, BJP coming into power and being totally anti. The government in Bengal, which has serious repercussions on Bengal's government, and will continue to have for quite some time. Mass scale corruption, no jobs in Bengal, no industry in Bengal. The position in relation to debt both in Bengal and for India as a whole. Very serious. Everybody is hiding that under the carpet. All economists say, wonderful, our GDP growth is now 7.1. Little talking about the fact that you are just regaining your original position before COVID. So GDP growth is actually about 1 to 2. Tremendous costs thanks to the Ukraine war, the mid prices have risen. That has become fairly unaffordable for the middle class and poor people. And then you go to the market, you can't buy a vegetable for less than 40 rupees. If you go to the cheaper markets like Chetapur or Iceland, you go to any of the expensive markets, nothing less than 60 rupees a day. Forget about meat and fish. So the Bengali who loves his fish, he has to do without it for a long time. And people don't talk about it at all. The economists don't talk about it. These are major defense problems, and the problem India is facing with relation to China, with relation to Pakistan, People glibly talk about a war on two fronts and managing it. Not possible. We don't have the wherewithal to do it. And neither financial wherewithal, nor military wherewithal. That's the truth of the matter. And nobody wants to admit that. And uh, all very well, people glibly say, make in India, make in India. What make in India? You don't have the basic infrastructure to make in India yet. So if it's no make in India, you are still importing and importing and importing the law. Where is that money to come from? They're asking us to cut your pension bills, change your recruiting scheme, 
and ruining the structure of the armed forces. This is going to really create problems for the armed forces. And I hope if we go into war, we'll be able to fight properly. Then a mess being made of democracy in this country. Today, in actual fact, what is institutional graph, MSMEs, small scale industry, and more or less collapsed. It's only the big industry, Adani's and the Ambani's, who are doing well. The rest, as a result of COVID and all this, very badly off. So there are no jobs for anyone. What the, these youngsters say that they have to go out of Bengal. But even in Delhi, you will not have a job now. But that is the state in this country. Something drastic has to be done in relation to jobs. And God help us if USA and China go to war over Taiwan. Then there is going to be mass scale recession in the whole world which will obviously have its effect on it. You may say you are the fastest growing economy, but you don't see it on ground. You see nothing on ground. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much, General Mukherjee. I have a question for you. Uh, coming from the armed forces, question relating to armed forces and people. When you speak to people who run organizations which are present all over the country, whether it be companies or speaking to people in different government departments, many people complain that you know, their units or offices based out of Bengal tend to be less productive, less efficient compared to other uh, places. I was wondering if you had a similar experience or you think similar, although armed forces works in its own bubble, and if so, why do you think that is? No, we don't allow that to happen with the armed forces. But the fact remains is, the, the Bengali thinks, I am a good Bengali, but the Bengali thinks that he's very cultured and academic and he's born lazy. He deserves a kick in the bloody backside. Forgive my language. And then answer your questions. Thank you, General. I'm very happy this is on the Chatham House rules, everybody. So, <laughs> no more attributing anything to anyone. I'll ask Professor Chatterjee to continue. I'll request you to please kindly introduce yourself for everyone before you start. Sir, uh, thank you very much to the organizers to begin with for this very, very important topic that we are discussing today. Uh, what has happened to my mentor? Uh, when we grew up, it was one of the leading states in India. Could you and uh, okay, sorry, sorry. I am Shiladitya Chatterjee. Uh, I spent the first 18 years of my service life in the Indian Administrative Service, working mainly in the Northeast, Assam and Bengala, uh, and the other 18 years in the Asian Development Bank. Uh, currently, I am advising various agencies, the UN state government, central government, uh, institutions in Delhi, and so on. Uh, and I'm doing a lot of writing. So what I'm going to speak today, actually, is from a recent paper I've written in uh, the Calgary University Journal uh, of the Economics Department. So uh, uh, again, uh, I think this, this topic requires actually a lot of discussion. I'm glad that you have taken this up. Uh, we Bengalis need to introspect very much longer. And of course, uh, two hours is not enough, certainly. Uh, we require maybe more than two days over several uh, sessions. The leading uh, kind of uh, uh, thinkers from Bengal and outside to come and discuss this topic. Maybe at some stage you will do it. So uh, maybe uh, it is a uh, Having said that, let me summarize very briefly what I think uh, in uh, very broad terms are the problems with Bengal and Bengal. As I said, this is based on the paper I had written during the Corona period when I had a lot of time in my hands. Uh, and uh, this is on this is called, uh, the paper is called uh, Bengal's Economic Legacy Since Independence and Future Prospects. Uh, you can see it and it's available in October. Okay, so uh, very broadly, the major constraints, let me talk about the major constraints that Bengal is facing. First, as uh, uh, General uh, Mukherjee mentioned, very rightly, uh, we, uh, of course, he spoke more about the overall Indian scenario, but the debt 
see, uh, in public finances of Bengal are in a very major, very, very difficult uh, area, uh, particularly because of the huge debt overhead. And this is because of the profligacy of earlier administrations in, in borrowing very heavily from the center. And uh, center was <laughs> very gladly gave the loans also uh, to all the states. Uh, not looking at what's going to happen in the future. So both uh, parties are to blame in a sense. But the result is that we have huge amount of interest payments and very little to spend there on. So our public finances are in a mess. And we are also doing very little to raise our own resources. Our Bengal's uh, kind of effort in tax raising, and, and both uh, tax and non-tax revenues, is very poor compared to the rest of India. Okay, so there we are also but this is one of the major problems we grapple with. We cannot have any public uh, action uh, because our public finances are in very poor shape. Now that is the first thing. Second thing is our very poor, and one of the uh, uh, our young uh, speakers at the beginning and referred to it, very poor human development. Now at the time of independence, West Bengal was at the leading stage. We were at Calcutta University was one of the leading universities, not only in India but Asia. And uh, its, uh, its colleges are very well known. Uh, the leading institutions, of course, are still pretty good. But overall, our, our human capital uh, kind of stock has, has not kept up. Uh, literacy, for example, 25% of the population is illiterate right now. 50% of school students don't go to secondary education. Less than 20%, and this was referred to by one of the speakers, I think you did. Less than 20% of, of uh, students go to higher education. This is abysmal compared to the rest of India. So we have not kept up. And despite the left from 30 years of left from rule, which was supposed to be inclusive in nature, they kind of did not support did not actually provide much support to education. And this is the, the, the result. The second very important uh, feature is physical capital, infrastructure. Both, for example, roads as well as power. Road availability, power availability, like this study of the eight largest states in India of which West Bengal is a competitor, we are the poorest in terms of surface roads available in terms of ability and usage of power, or capital usage of power. So infrastructure is in a very, very poor shape. You cannot have any industrialization without proper industry, without industrial base. Okay. Third, let's come to the sectors, industry. This, of course, is the biggest problem that we are facing, lack of industrialization. As one of the speakers mentioned, uh, young speaker mentioned, that, uh, there was an attempt at the later part of uh, left front rule to rectify this problem, uh, but uh, they started off uh, uh, kind of undermining their own own land policy. Uh, we all know that uh, kind of what happened thereafter. Uh, it became a huge political problem. They lost uh, they lost massively in the elections. Uh, but land remains a huge problem. Policy has still not been changed in favor of providing land. For Apart from uh, infrastructure, apart from infrastructure, human development, land policy is again a major problem. But I think the most, more than that, the most important problem is perceptions. Perceptions, investor perceptions about West Bengal remain bleak actually. And that's because of one, uh, previous historical problems of, of strikes and lockouts, uh, even though there have been very major improvement and, and we must credit this particular government for banning all, all, all the industrial action, where, uh, which has led to a vast, very vast improvement in industrial relations, yet that perception persists. And, and despite that, it, uh, West Bengal still has the highest level of loss of uh, mandates in, in terms of industrial action. Continues. The other thing, and this was also mentioned by uh, one of the speakers, is this continuous conflict between the center and the states. Now, for a state, for any state to develop, you cannot have this confrontation. West Bengal is too important, as Jagan also mentioned it, 
it is very important for not only Eastern India, I say important for the whole of India. I think the central government also recognizes this. So it is a joint responsibility for the development and we must try and somehow stop this problem between the centre and the states. They, see, which industrialists to come here with that uncertainty that you know what's going to happen here when there's so much of a problem between the centre and the state. Look at, look at our next door neighbour, Odisha. Odisha has sorted out this problem. It remains politically non-aligned, politically opposed at, this, at, the, at the state level, but provides issue-based kind of support to the centre. So it has made some kind of peace to the central government. I think some kind of political accommodation is required and to end this continuous squabbling between the centre and the state. Otherwise, we are not going to work. Okay, that's industry. Agriculture, which is our mainstay, which is very important for the state, did very well <coughs> for a certain period under left front rule when the uh, you know tendency reforms came in. That provided a huge spurt to agriculture. There was, in fact, West Bengal's growth rate and agriculture were the best amongst the states in India at that time. But then it splattered off because no further investment is taking place in rural infrastructure like irrigation, like uh, you know, farm to market roads and so on and so forth. So much more uh, sort of importance to agriculture has to be made, investment has to be made. Okay, I've spoken a lot about the negatives. Now, what are the opportunities? Now, if, if we rectify all of these, of course, these will provide a base for future growth. But I think right now, there are a lot of opportunities we are not using. One is, uh, the background paper that was circulated for this mentions this, uh, tourism. We have huge tourism potential in this state, uh, which is not being properly utilized. And I think that is one area. We have a, a very, very developed logistics base. Uh, we, we are sitting at, the, at, the, at, at a very strategically at, at the mouth of the Bay of Bengal, where shipping and other lines are there, railway networks are there, uh, the, the national highway networks are there. This can be used and utilized further to develop uh, uh, the future uh, investments in West Bengal. But more important, and again, this is something which one of our young uh, sort of speakers did mention, regional cooperation. Partition, I think he also mentioned this. Partition has been one of the major problems which has affected West Bengal. And the overhang has continued, did continue right up to the mid, mid 80s, uh, the, the partition over, overhang. But the major loss of uh, markets, major loss of internet can be rectified if we have better regional cooperation. We can then utilize uh, the, the huge market of, of, of Bangladesh and the Northeast to develop the state. So I think I'll stop here. Maybe we can discuss further your question answers. Thank you so much, Dr. Chatterjee. What a uh, lovely discussion uh, on uh, the uh, historical reasons, pros and cons, uh, all of that in the world. A lot of things that I could identify with, uh, you know, things like land policy also. I know a lot of, uh, I don't know if the land ceiling act still remains, but I know a lot of real estate companies who, you know, uh, house their land holdings in hundreds of companies and develop a single project on top of land which is held by, you know, many, many different companies to get around some laws. don't know what exactly. And then you talked about my days and productivity and uh, you know, we discussed briefly about that. Uh, one of the things that also, uh, you know, in terms of having the basic infrastructure, there have been a lot of complaints about generally law and order being in a little bit of a poorer state in West Bengal, which really impedes industrial activity and things like that. So and also the, uh, the Bengal court systems are so notorious for delays compared to uh, many other states. But uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Moss, please. Thank you. Thank you all for providing this. Excellent forum. I enjoyed the for inviting me on to this so I can meet uh, all of you lovely people. It's lovely to be here. Uh, my name is Sumit Bose. I retired as the Union Finance Secretary in 2014. I uh, came back to Calicutta in about three years and I'm now living here. But I left Calcutta at an early age also. I left uh, for my schooling in 65. So, uh, of course, Calcutta was very much home. Here, but I haven't lived here since then, so I can feel the change. I'm, I will not talk about the negatives. Let me see what uh, there's plenty. I mean, we can go on and on. Let me see from my experience what I can, what sort of positives I can come. Uh, 
in Edinburgh. Three years I've been here. Uh, let me start with a slightly morbid joke that I often joke around. People ask, is it a good place to live in? I said, yes, it's a good place to live in, even a better place to die. Because <laughs> it is the only city where you can go into a territory and get a proper death certificate. In the sense, every other city in this country, it's a two-stage affair. You, you, you get a piece of paper, you take it to the municipal corporation, there you should get it. So we have cracked it. I'm, I'm giving you this example not from a morbid angle. From this, they either out of laziness, but we have cracked this problem. If we have cracked a problem which no other city, including Mumbai Municipal Corporation, they said so much about COVID. If they haven't cracked it, why can't we crack all other problems? And in fact, I see a steady progress. Look at the, the, the Municipal Corporation website, for example. It's the best, it is one of the best in the country. I mean, and the ease of uh, paying your taxes, the ease of paying now electricity bills, is, is definitely way up way there. So it's not that things cannot move. All this is not sort of tied up to a bigger thing. But these small examples, and maybe we can use our laziness by uh, put that into good effect because if you, can, if you have to continue to be lazy, someone has to facilitate this. Uh, this is a very, very bad position. I mean, maybe I've been in the government seeing this since I spent four and a half years in the finance ministry. The security disinvestment expenditure and revenue have seen very close problems. But for B5, in fact, everything improved. There was a tax effort also improved under this government. It's come down again. There was an effort. I, I remember coming here with the then finance minister, Mr. Pradhan Mukherjee, when this government was taking over. I was asked, what, what is the one thing you can do? I said, you should more bigger licenses. You will really work on excise, for example. You are deeply uh, collecting, uh, underpinned, penetrated in that sense, and, uh, of, and then you have to visit take a lot of the place. efforts to make. And in fact, collections did go on. And the Finance Commission has also noted that tax effort, which Shila did also uh, referred to. Perhaps it has not been consistent, it has not been enough. But the result is that it's not. Right now, for example, in the last year, financial year for which we have actual the actuals, I mean, not uh, some projections or, or estimates, is 2021. And capital expenditure, what we spend in the roads of buildings and, and, and concrete things, has fallen to 1%. In, and it was even it was 2.3 when the last finance commission, 15 finance commission, sort of had conservation with this new and then talked about it. Capital expenditure, it has fallen to 1%. So there are, there are possible, there are, but it's not. So obviously, government found a way of raising taxes. Even the finance commissioners uh, remarked on it, saying that efforts were made, that the digital uh, move uh, worked, and then something happened. I, I don't know. But uh, so it's possible. It's not that it's not possible. Similarly, utilization of funds under this on under secretary sponsored schemes. When I was a joint secretary in education for five years, we were doing the Sarva Siksha Abhiyan. It was such an adamant attitude of Western Paul. We had, for, the, for this state alone, and because I was there, we could create a, a channel of funds to the Panchayati Raj uh, Department to run schools because that department, for some reason, here was willing to take uh, city funds. And we actually created that. The only state where the Panchayati Raj uh, Department got funds from the Education Department of the, the Ministry of the uh, Central Government. And, but again, in the last 10, 12 years, central funds have been used, misused, whatever it is, but funds have been, more funds have been utilized than ever before. So again, that possibility of using central funds for the best uh, use in the state exists, has been done, perhaps can, can continue to be done, even in a, even in a situation where the, central, uh, the two governments are different, the federal government is different from the state government, would it be? So okay, that's possible. So these are all the possibilities I'm seeing. When it comes to white agriculture, and agriculture support. Look at this: largest producer of paddy juice, pineapple, vinegar, cabbage. Second largest producer of potatoes. Second largest producer of tea and fish. Second largest cold storage capacity. And and uh, 
and, 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 and the, uh, so the area and the intensity, uh, intensive uh, dropping is the, uh, is the most in this state compared to the rest of India. So obviously we are getting things right. Surprisingly, and I am in a, on the board of a company which is in fact uh, it has a subsidy which sells uh, small uh, combine harvesters, uh, rice millers and things. Even there, actually sales are taking place in West Bengal. These numbers are small. I mean, uh, overall the numbers in, in, in the country are small, these sales of these. But actually sales are taking place. So something is happening in, 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 in agriculture in this industry, which is uh, perhaps not properly captured. Even again, the number of GST legislation, and this was noted in around 1718 when the 15 Finance Commission, they remarked, and then I would recommend this uh, as, a, as also, there, there's a chapter on West Bengal, the 15 Finance Commission uh, report contains chapters on every state in the state report. So this says, the state has achieved the highest growth in the number of new registrations under GST in the whole country. So again, Something happened. Net result, uh, I mean, combined result, we may, may, be, may not be able to see. IT, I think, see, people not because of lack of capital. Capital has been removed. Government doesn't have the capital to, to invest. But in, in sectors like IT, it's possible, possibly something is happening in innovation, something is happening, something is not happening also, but something is happening which we will see in artificial intelligence and innovation, things which, which, are, which require certainly a different skill set than uh, what, we, what we require uh, for uh, industrialization in the traditions. I, I think, uh, so I see a lot of possibilities and perhaps uh, we will see a time when these possibilities or a method by which these possibilities can be sort of brought together to achieve something. Even in education, let me tell you, the dismal widget, again, I keep pointing out the dismal situation in the rest of the country, where we see educational institutions being systematically destroyed by the sort of appointments which are taking place. I am talking about the uh, state sector. It provides a great opportunity for private sector education to flourish. And perhaps if this state could legislate, no, See, now we have an opportunity for the state legislature to pass an act to set up a university. Even for private university, it's been done. We have a private university, I forget the name, running in out of DKC, that financial sector <coughs> in Mumbai. There's a university functioning out of that. One building set up by an act of the government of Maharashtra. <coughs> I'm not saying, I'm not recommending that you only do it in Delhi, but what I'm saying is, there is a possibility for, for in this state to ask that law set. Someone else comes in, feels that no, West Bengal is a better place because we, we don't have that sort of strife here. We have a more liberal culture here. So maybe my university will do better here. So I'm bringing in the capital. Let the state only pass the law to facilitate. So I see a lot of possibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Boss. I'll ask you to quickly comment on one thing. Uh, I know we're a little, uh, you know, over time. But uh, one thing which a lot of other speakers brought up. Quickly, your brief comments on uh, center-state relations, poor state of center-state relations, and the poor state of state finances, public finance. State finance, finance, finances. I did comment on the fact that we are able to spend only one percent. We in West Bengal is only able to spend one percent on capital expenditure, uh, and the revenue deficit as high as uh, two point something. It's, it's a dismal state. But one thing, let, let, let me see. There are other states, there's Punjab also, along with, uh, uh, with us as far as the debt is So, and one thing, yeah, that is a problem. But the central government can never afford, nor can the, the central government and the national economy can never afford for a state to go belly up. It cannot happen in our uh, in our federal system. So we so from that we have to take some amount of comfort. That no 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 state can be allowed. <laughs> it cannot be allowed that, that because see then you face a different regime in the international. If if you go if you if you recognize that each state manages its finances, 
even the vessel uh, uh, agreements, RBI will have to negotiate different sort of agreements. So they will not have guarantee. There is an implicit set of guarantee. Yes, there is an implicit set of guarantee. Yes, guarantee. But yes, and, and, and as I said, there was monitoring attempts at uh, raising revenue. So we have to accept that overnight this is not going to go up. The next finance commission will do something. We have to raise our own revenue. So the second question you asked about? Just sector state relation, then it affects the economy. Sector state, it, it affects, but can we wish, uh, wish it away? We cannot. So we have to live with it. We, we have to live with it. I, I think uh, uh, within that, as I said, there are companies. And why, why did central, uh, it, uh, central sector schemes expenditures went up? ITIs, I forgot to mention this. Another example is it, maybe I am really just uh, I'm narrating something I've overheard. But uh, the DG skill development in government of India, she had worked with me in, in the state. I worked mainly in Madhya Pradesh, I was, that, that was my partner. Uh, she said, so surprisingly, ITI is in West Bengal are producing first class uh, uh, graduates out there who are, I said, where are they getting jobs? They are getting all, the rest of the country, Middle East, everywhere. So here is a sector, someone, an official of central government is Say, saying this, I am not, I am only repeating what uh, she told me. So, I, 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 for whatever reasons, these, are, these ITIs are doing a splendid job in this. So, it is possible to do things. So, as I said, small things have happened, it is not added up. Someone has to make sure, and that only the government can take the lead and the state government, uh, to make sure that it all adds up something. Thank you so much. Any question, Mr. Pine? I'll uh, thank uh, Mr. Chakravarti to uh, invite me over here because uh, I'm very thrilled to be in this August presence, and I don't know whether I uh, fit to be a member of this August crowd. I'm a civil engineer by profession, and uh, I might share a few examples from my experience of working in the classroom. So I would actually uh, sort of. Uh, Compliment what this host has uh, seen and uh, explained in a very nice way from his own experiences. That when we talk of Bengal, uh, we generally have a tendency to debrand our state. And uh, not all of these are based on knowledge. Like I was a little surprised to see our young uh, friend the teacher mentioned that after all uh, deep brands. Jadavpur University and Target University has been nominated among the top four or five uh, best universities in the country by uh, institutions who are not very friendly to it. So we can accept that. Uh, and regarding uh, uh, some other uh, usual things that are said about the involved is about not working and that the movement to say that. I would say that that is about the two percent of Bengal is from Kolkata. Bengal is one of the largest and the most popular state of the country. It is more of the self-sufficient on agriculture, but we at Kolkata are completely oblivious of what the rest of Bengal is thinking or the rest of Bengal has developed. Like I would say, I, I go to the villages often and in, as we mentioned, I would just add to it, that one central scheme that is the rural uh, road scheme by one by, was introduced by I think the uh, UK too and it was also done in the first uh, it was, uh, yeah, 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 yeah for the first uh, India. Bengal has achieved the rural road length amongst the largest network in the country. If you go to any village now, you would find concrete road that is that is connecting uh, the villages to the nearest state highways. There is a problem of land because Bengal has uh, one of the uh, highest uh, population density in the country. So it is not easy to even get land for uh, making roads. But in spite of that, the condition of the roads have vastly improved in the last six or eight years. The Bengali workers, as I said, the skilled workers, they are in great demand throughout the country. Uh, one of my friends was making a study and he uh, went from here to Kozigo over by train. He took the train and he said that the entire train was full of Bengali workers who were doing Kerala to work. So these, I think, are positive aspects. And uh, how to 
uh, as I always mention that uh, uh, sometimes that uh, uh, all the Nobel laureates from the country are related to Bengal song, and uh, that includes the latest one, uh, Professor Obhijit Banerjee, who has uh, studied in two of the very Bengal institutions, South Point School and uh, later on Presidency College. So it does not really uh, give a very bad uh, uh, symbol for the country, unless the Bengalis will decide to keep that out. Uh, this is one part of it. Second part of it is what are the uh, major areas that uh, Bengal can uh, look forward uh, to gain more uh, uh, employment, generation of employment and uh, as also uh, uh, financial stability. One such area should be the textile and handicraft sector. So uh, I have some figures, but I need not the figures in the So the development in the textile sector only, including exports, has been phenomenal. Uh, it was going on a good trajectory before uh, it was uh, stopped by the COVID period, of course, that there was a lot of problem. And uh, I share one of my personal experience, like I don't know whether uh, if people know about a particular type of uh, uh, textile weaving called Baluchari. Baluchari was yes. more or less completely dead. So uh, we, I was involved in a small plan to resuscitate the Baluchari factory. It was around about 2011 and 12. We could do uh, uh, exhibition of Baluchari textiles in uh, Rome and in Italy and in Paris. And then you can have now the Baluchari whole Baluchuri section and in a, a Baluchuri shop put up by the government that was people under the watchful eyes of Mother Teresa's statue in the corner. That more or less a survived with the, that club that was almost on the verge of completing that. Somebody mentioned about opening up the border with Bangladesh. <coughs> I think that is very necessary because Bangladesh is one of the economic power and uh, the Lucas policy is, has not really been uh, followed up by the government of India uh, uh, as it uh, should have been. So the integration of the economies to some extent would have benefited both the countries. Uh, Bengal now has more or less excess power. Uh, uh, the, uh, the power situation is quite good and that is not also a personal experience. If many of the southern states are now really uh, under active power shortage of the past year in Kolkata and So we have to think of it, we have to all join and, and one more thing that I have to say, I think we must have had that, that uh, West Bengal has a lot of uh, uh, government, has a lot of loans, but the total loan as a percentage of the state GDP has progressively gone down. Uh, that was 37%. Uh, as a, as a state, 37% of GDP yeah. So from the, as it is one now, I found it out from somebody mentioned about Shubhaji Shubhaji Bhakti's uh, yes, state was there. Yeah, but it's still, but it is comparable to some of the states that we really think of as very progressive, like Kerala or uh, Punjab. What is the Punjab is that bad. Punjab, but Kerala is yeah. but Kerala is a much smaller state with a much smaller population with a very uh, number of population uh, staying in big list. So. So these are the basic things. I think that Bengal should try to go beyond Calcutta and release the potential of the rest of Bengal. Bengal is the only state in the country which could not have multiple centers of uh, uh, development that all the states have made after independence. Bengal has remained vastly Calcutta centric. There are so many <coughs> reasons and the reasons of the, uh, the, the typical uh, uh, character of the Bengali society is responsible for that. Uh, that is one. And then improving and helping the individual entrepreneurship in the village and rural level. That would, I think, uh, make uh, uh, rather than looking forward to getting big uh, heavy capital investing uh, uh, big industries. The small industrial industry could actually work for it. That's, uh, I am not an expert in it, but uh, this is 
my I, I speak from my experience. That's it. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Bhakti. I'll request the next speaker to kindly introduce himself. Good afternoon, Thank you, Chair. My name is Ishani Nasper and I'm the Department of International Relations at Delta University. So uh, my, my kind of tough situation is I'm an economist, ex-practitioner, bureaucrats, and barely say happy divisions. Uh, and my basic training is in political science, but uh, let me confess, originally I was planning to go to bureaucracy, but then something happened in Jane and I thought that let us stick to academics. My basic training is in political science, and so when I talk, see, you know, we're speaking their own numbers and things like that, so probably I will not be able to be so explicit about that. And because I'm in the academic field and students already set the tone, I will still talk about education. And uh, you see, uh, we are here to talk about the goods and bads of what is happening in the Western world right now. And I will start with what good has happened. Uh, as far as the education sector is concerned, and I will, I will also confine to more or less higher education because that is my forte. You see, uh, if you see, you know, the quantity, if you look at it from the quantitative aspect, uh, the last, I was last two terms, the last two terms of the present government has seen actually a huge, you know, uh, splurge or a huge rise in terms of infrastructure facilities. The number of universities have gone up from 20, it is almost doubled. It's around 46 or 47, which sounds a fantastic number and it will continue to rise the way it is going. We have about 1,400 plus colleges also in this country. And I, as my previous uh, speaker was referring to uh, the National Institution of Ranking Framework, which looks at the performance of various uh, colleges and universities and eminent centers of education. I will just share a couple of data which will show you that where uh, the higher institutes in West Bengal stand. Uh, we take the overall ranking, the IIT Kharagpur stands in the fifth, the Jadapur is at 12th, Calcutta University is 15th, it was 12th before or something like that, but now it is 15. And the National Institute of Technology in Durgapur is 72. I'm taking the first 100 if you see. Uh, colleges, the first 100, we have seven from West Bengal, where St. Xavier's is at eight. Then we have uh, Ramakrishna Vishen with Vidyam, the Ramakrishna line of co you know, colleges. We have Ramakrishna Vidyam from Howrah, we have Ramakrishna Rohora, and Ramakrishna Narendrapur, which are at 9, 13, and 19. Then we have, very interestingly, college from Midnapur. We were talking about not only, you know, city, it is also about the rural area. So we have a college from Midnapur, which is 73rd. Then Bethel College is in Kolkata, 74th, and Midnapur College, which is a very old college, almost a very, like a heritage college, and it's 77. Among universities, Jadavpur is 4th, and Calcutta University is 8th, University of Vardhaman is 87th, Vishwabharati is 98th. So I'm just trying to tell you that where our education system in terms of ranking, ranking speaks. There are a lot of debate whether rankings are, you know, what are the criteria and parameters. But since we go by a certain kind of mandate, we believe the, you know, the rankings indicate how education is performing in West Bengal. But as far as the management is concerned, the IM management is at third. The IIT Kharagpur has a management part of it, it's 12. And International Management Institute is 59th, which is located in Kolkata. In terms of engineering, IIT Kharagpur is at 5th, Jadavpur University is 11th, National Institute of Technology, which is at Durgapur, is 34th, and Institute of Engineering, Science and Technology, which is very famous at Shivpur, is 40th. Okay? Now, very interesting, since I'm from the university genre, research, where you get the you know, institution of eminence, uh, IIT Kharagpur stands 5th, and Jadavpur stands 13th. So if the rankings can speak for themselves, the education sector seemingly is doing quite well for the last, I would say, the last two terms that we've seen for the government. And people were talking about, still there are issues. If you see the carryover from the left government, if you see the gestation period of the two terms that we're talking about, there has been, in terms of quantity, a considerable improvement. When you look at the All India Serve in Higher Education, which is the document to which you refer to when you start looking at how your know, education systems are, or institutions in various parts of the country are performing. The 
2019-20 record which shows that, as I said, colleges per lakh population in West Bengal is 30, whereas the average national average is 13. Sorry, 13, but the national average is 30. So that is one phase that you want to look at. Uh, the gross enrollment ratio is the national average is 38.6 but instead it's 19.9. That speaks volume for itself and Sir has already mentioned about how much of uh, the enrollment is now affected. And I, I also would like to add here, which is from my personal experience, that a lot of students have dropped out during the pandemic. During the pandemic, this has really taken a very big toll because of the kind of various factors that we will talk about later. The pupil ta uh, teacher ratio in the regular mode of education the national average is 26, but for Bengal it is 33. For at level of universities, the national average is 38, but in Bengal it is 43. So therefore that is also one place one has to look at very, very importantly. As far as the budget allocation <coughs> is concerned, uh, if you look at the latest figures, the estimated budget for uh, Bengal this time is 16.8, 16.8% of the state budget it is allocating. Roughly, if you see, the budget remains around 17 to 18%, okay? Which interestingly, the national budget is roughly around 15 to 16%. So the government in, in, in our uh, state is a lot allocating a lot. So you see a lot of proliferation of educational institutes are happening. But now I come to the other part of the story, I will be contradicting myself probably, is that this proliferation of infrastructure has it led to qualitative enhancement of education, particularly in higher education. This is one thing that we all need to look at as we all agree and the uh, note that Ambassador has said uh, to us, all of us, it says that education speaks for what we are going to create in the future. So if you look at in terms of that, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, there are a lot of things to actually look at. One is the kind of syllabus that we are all following in various educational institutions. We're trying to look about skill development and trying to promote our next generation who are many of are already thinking and very candidly saying that they would like to go to any other state, maybe even out of the country. It is time to relook and rehash. And I must say, dare I say, I can speak for myself and people I know, there is also a lot of resistance to actually try to bring about a major overhaul in the kind of syllabus that we have in various institutes, which should be matching national or international standards. This is one thing I think we must look very, very importantly. And one thing when I talk about the kind of you know, contradiction between quantity and quality, well, we must accept that the present government of the Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee has really given a lot of financial support to the peripheral areas in terms of Kanyashri, in terms of uh, Shobhut Shati, in terms of Novanno, there is a scholarship called Novanno in terms of OA scholarships. There are a lot of scholarships that are coming up. But whether those scholarships are actually ensuring the kind of education that or the kind of, you know, the, uh, I would say, the return that is expected, that I think is something one has to do. So when I spoke to a couple of girls as to what are you going to do with the money you receive from Konyashi, because at one time when you turn 18, if you continue to study, you will get a lump sum money. And the answer is very simple and candid, we're going to give it to our parents because that will be my pony and taka. Okay? So quantity does not ensure quality. I'm only sharing one example. And I completely agree with my previous speaker that center-state relations will also impact education a lot. You know, it is given a situation, the center-state relations right now is going to get unfortunately rougher, though I do understand you will never really get to that extent where, you know, the financials could be hit or things like that. But the rate that we for example, the NEP that we are talking about, there is a lot of discourse happening on NEP. I am very, very sure that the government of the state, that, that is West Bengal government, will not be able to, will not endorse a lot of things that are within the NEP. Because this is a concurrent list. This is a concurrent list. So this is a area where, you know, education is going to take a lot of hit. We are also financially quite crippled as far as 
higher education and research. Look at the data that I shared. There's so many universities and, and you know, Institute of Excellence and eminent and professional universities and private universities, sir. But in terms of research, we only have two institutes, two organized, two universities, and that too Karakpur is central, and only Jadapur as a state public university is taken as a, you know, area of eminence. If you do not get the funding, we do not get the support, then it is very difficult for education to survive. So under that circumstances, well, I endorse that there has a lot of happened, a lot has been happening, but whether that will give the kind of you know outcome we are looking for, particularly for future students. I have talked to my family people, I've talked to neighbors, most of them who are talented, most of them are doing a good score, is very candid in saying, no, we don't want to continue here. We are only going to Delhi, we go to Bombay, we go, and those who can afford, we can go abroad. And I've asked, I've asked in a couple of days before I went to a marriage and I asked my nephew, so what are you planning to do? He's in law. He said, I'm going abroad. I said, why? But there's nothing here. We come here, we, we start practicing, we have to become the part of the political game that is happening here. You have to be, I just like, great. either you are with us, you are not with us. So this kind of attitude and this kind of you know, political ambience that we are surviving in, unfortunately, is also going to take its toll. Thank you for your attention. Very good. Thank you so much for very, very vibrant and very eye-opening comments. I think we all really enjoyed uh, listening to them and uh, really thought provoking. Thank you so much for requesting the next speaker. Please introduce you. I am Brigadier Nilakri Mukherjee, uh, retired in 2003, settled now in Kolkata, otherwise mostly a Provashi, who's now settled in Kolkata uh, with the chairs and all of yours indulgence. Mine will be some random thoughts. Although I had economics as a subject in undergrad and I've been following some of the uh, most passionate panel discussions that we now see on the TV channels. Uh, I personally feel two or three things must be taken into account. The state of economy of West Bengal is no pushover. Some of the speakers have mentioned very categorically, we did in some things. We are there, up there, somewhere. And in certain parameters, we have gone down. But that's the reality of most states. How do we improve the economy? Now, everyone talks about industrialization. Industrialization is not going to happen in a day or a month or, a, or six months. Industrialization in the way the federal structure is and the realities of the ground, if uh, investments have to be put in by either the private players or even the state governments. Land acquisition, getting the people rehabilitated if you want to clear certain areas, getting the entire thing up and about, and by the time you get into manufacturing and selling those goods, it's going to be years. By then, I'm not going to be around to get the spoils of what exactly the economy will improve with. So therefore, how do we improve the economy now with what we have? Very interestingly, in our war game in the war college, most times when there is a red land and a blue land, and some of the appointments which are created there for training, one is asked by the directing staff, uh, where the opposite side has this, 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 so many squadrons of air force and so many this that the other you have so how do you propose to fight the battle and how do you propose to do the whole thing and would you win the chap who's the blue land forces says no no i want four more squadrons of you know tanks and two more squadrons of air force so the directing staff has to tell him look you've got to fight with what you have nobody's going to give you if everything is given to you then where is the problem so therefore, let us see what we have and how can we, from here, quickly establish the kind of base from where we can take a quantum jump later on. I noticed that most of the times people talk about everybody leaving from here and wanting to go to different places to get a job or settle down and do rightly life. But the fact remains that migration by itself is also an economic activity. Pakistan today is surviving on remittances. So therefore, let us not take this as some exodus that is taking place from our place. You have a skill. That skill can be employed in Gujarat. Go there, earn your money, remit your money. So therefore, that is not a case that I stand by. Now, what is it that we have at the moment that needs to be done? 
four things come to my mind, and these are random thoughts. Bantola, I am told, is the biggest leather hub in Asia. Why can't it be the biggest leather hub of the world? And in a short time frame, reason being, there is 30 percent minority population of the country of, of the state, which is a Muslim minority. They have no issues with the cow getting slaughtered and their leather being used. And so are we, the remaining 70 percent, not too paranoid about this entire thing, like the rest of the North Indian cow belt is. Why don't we have the entire thing streamlined in a manner and not look for political dividends out of this? And so many Jai Sri Rams being climbing up. Let's make this the biggest leather factory in the world. Already things have moved from Kanpur and Chennai to West Bengal. The other day I had attended a function there in the BCCS and I and a former chief secretary had mentioned that all our problems and this is the uh, thing that is being mostly talked about these days in some of the panel discussions. West Bengal's problem started with partition. Most of the resources were there, the raw materials came from there, the jute was there, the jute mills were here. And he proposed that if the economy of both the uh, you know, I mean, East, uh, the West Bengal and Bangladesh is integrated, only then can we really become an economic prosperous. No, that's an independent sovereign nation. It's got to be steered by the central government. Yours is a state. And whether you want to integrate or not, of course it can happen. Again, the time factor. So let's look at leather, something which is doable in a short time frame. <coughs> look at tourism. I have been fortunate enough in my 35 years of service to have traveled the length and breadth of this country extensively. There is not a state which I have not been in for considerable periods. And I can tell you that West Bengal has so many beautiful places to go to and the poorest entire infrastructure, if it can be in a short time frame improved, it can really work wonders. There is tremendous em employment that can be generated. Investments is far less in this sector. And then is healthcare. So tourism, healthcare, leather. And in our discussions, what I notice is two more things which can happen. Our steel frame has got politicized here in the state. Totally. If we can prevent pilferage and leakages on the ground, most things will get shorted out. Finally, all I have to say is that if we have to improve the state of economy in the immediate future, we have to build on what we have, the strengths of what we have. And uh, thereabouts, I think, is the, lies the answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Begin. We've got a very uh, charged up discussion and bringing uh, the discussion to the point of what can we do with what we have and what can we do now in a short time frame. So, uh, emphasizing the practical aspects of the actions to be taken. Thank you. Very, very uh, I think I'll request Professor Mukherjee. Well, I'm Shumon Mukherjee. Um, I'm a general council member of SNSK. I'm delighted to share some of the points and I'd like to echo some of the points mentioned by Professor Noshkar. The uh, issue is very clearly, and as far as I'm concerned, when we were in school and we were in college, there was a fear of failure. When we appeared in any exam, we didn't know what questions would come. And therefore, out of panic, we used to study much more than needed. Tutorials was nearly gone on because we went to the library. But then came a world where we were told there's going to be a question bank to enable students to pass. That was the death knell of education in West Bengal. Because uh, questions then became a part of the last five years repository of things and you could predict <coughs> what will be the questions this year. So I have been privileged to teach many of the students who have topped the university, first class first, including one who won the Nobel Prize is to attend my lectures in St. Xavier's. But I am aware that their knowledge base is less than 25% of their course. Because nobody prepared more than 13 of the 14 topics that were expected to be done. So therefore, by and large, even the topper was ignorant. And uh, 
he knew how to pass an exam, which was a skill. And if he had the resources, he could reach to a tutorial home or get the question answers for that and pass it. Now it's come to a desperate situation, where the questions are made in such a way that large chunks of students really pass. I tried to tie up, tie up one of the institutes where I was heading with a foreign university, and the first question they asked me, and this was on the Jadhapur University, uh, the, the BBA course which I created in Bengal, uh, and I brought in all the material that was needed for MBA in a three-year program so that they learn whatever they need to do, MBA should be where they specialize. And the British partners came and said, what's your level of failure? Said, unfortunately, I have a lot of failures in maths. I said, we are delighted. Because the screen of performance is when you have failures. The alternative is now seen. Average mark, and the last mark that I've had in my institute this year at Bamaripur, the lowest mark taken is 91. I mean, a mark which I never got. So, so 91. So, and the standard is you have to take students according to marks by merit list. How do you compare ICSE with CBSE with Pataliputra with Shomarashtra with Chennai? different boards, different standards, and say, strictly by marks. You think you're being honest. You're actually utterly corrupt. The whole process is, if you want an admission done, go to the party office, they will take the spoils and recommend so and so should be beaten in the list. Uh, if this is what education is coming to, you know, I, I just start up Shadbur Shikha, the Obijan, Largest taker is West Bengal. We would like to pat ourselves on the back. Unfortunately, I'm one of the members in the Shadwashi Khan Obijan, and I've been there from 2010. You wouldn't believe this is a central government fund, but the ministers concerned who run this department, one of them presently is behind bars, the other one is there, never held a meeting. We had Pratichi Amartasen having a representative, we had Chet Majala, we had Sudha Paul, a national professor. All of them resigned from the board. And I was told, please don't resign by the secretary, because there's a meeting fees, and if everybody goes, we won't be able to raise this funds. Ah. And so 10 years running, all the funds were taken, but we never saw even the meeting fee or traveling expenses. And I'm still in that committee, because I was told, please don't resign, because there'll be a problem. And uh, to your surprise, if you know, uh, in 10 years, we have not had even 10 meetings. Last three years, we didn't have one meeting. The last time I objected to it, and I said, I'm not going to be a party to it. I was called to the assembly and said, OK, uh, what is your issue? I said, there are so many things we can do. We could bring in television sets into rural areas. We could have lectures in Calcutta, which could be telecast there. And the students can be learning that. That's what's being done in Bangalore. And I can help you get a World Bank grant for this. Why did I say that? Because Mr. Pradeep Khaitan is in Bangalore. And he said, Professor Mumpiti, who was with the Birla Group once, and I was a director of one of the Birla colleges, he says, why didn't you suggest this and get this done? So I said, let's have this in a, in a state, state case. But there are no kickbacks if you take a World Bank grant. So no one was interested to take the television set onto the rural areas which have rooms without, uh, without, without terraces, there are no latrines, there are no teachers, and we say we are doing well. When you are playing with numbers, and I raised it in one of the meetings where I had with, with where I was asked to question the Prime Minister, Chief Minister, and I raised this. When we were students, uh, the best uh, used to come to the country, to West Bengal, to learn. Today the toppers are leave. The first dream, yeah. and as I sit across, I see all of you have been out of the state. Uh, why did we do that? At that time it was not sure. But now it's not not sure. If I have a grandson, I'll say certainly not the state. Get out of the state. Because I know the fast that education is going through. And uh, if you want to get your house in order and say that I'm going to have students according to merit, which I tried, 
and for two years, I mean, for seven, five years, I've been doing it, selecting every student that I take. I started that with uh, one of the Billa colleges, and we went up the rungs of the ladder, and I'm sure Mrs. Bhagat remembers that. And uh, now I'm doing it with another college, and in no time, I've hit the sixth position in the country, in my department, because I was choosy about who I select. Last two years, I don't have any say who's getting in. And this is scandalous. I'm going to teach a student without even seeing his background. And now he comes with, uh, uh, on special days, on kurtas and pajamas, and says that uh, it's, uh, I had to go to the, my prayer or the masjid, and therefore you have to allow me with these clothes. And I have to tolerate that. So uh, there is nothing called hands. People are coming in with covered heads and burkhas and things which we never saw in our college or the school days. That's not happening in college, and that has to be tolerated in terms of you have a freedom to dress. I mean, there should be a uniform code that you are in college, and you are going to be in office. So if you're going to teach management, please be with the people because you're all one. But who's there to hear us? And when this happens, and when there is corruption around the corner, and your questions are predictable, and if you're influential, you can even change your marks in the university, what is left of education? And in this kind of uh, what we call um, root canal in your tooth where your tooth is dead, I don't think there's a future for the country because you've told the students how to be corrupt. And you've told them that you can get away with life without losing your sport. When Swami Vivekananda said that uh, unless you have a strong body, you cannot have a strong mind, the fact is most of our educational institutes do not have a playground. So what kind of characters are you creating? Uh, if you don't have a playground, you don't have the spine to take a defeat, you don't even know where you stand, you bulldoze your way through. Therefore, in every corner, we industry, uh, we have two acres of land to dirty with the university. And my chairman is very close to the local government. And I asked him, why, why aren't you doing this? He says, because uh, the syndicate will come in and ask me, give us the orders to do the building. So we are going to touch it unless there's a change. And it, why is that happening? Because there are no jobs. There are no jobs. So I don't blame them for saying that if you have so much of money, give me a cut, let, let's survive. And I'd rather give that, but allow me to build a building with the material I want. So when you talk about perception being low, it deserves to be low because nothing moves without the political blessings of the party. It started with CPM, it's become worse now. So political maneuvers have to stop if you want to increase the perception of uh, this being a state where you can come in. So the two most important things is health. I remember Calcutta Medical College used to be the talk of the country. Now if you fall sick, why just education? You'll run to Velour, you'll run to Jipmar, but you won't trust your so-called um, sharks here for any kind of operation because they'll go through the whole process. Even if you have a problem in your uh, toenail, they'll make you do a CT scan. So if this is the kind of uh, corruption. The corruption that operates in the city, and from top to bottom, uh, health, education, tourism. I worked very closely with the jute industry. And uh, that's, you know, we, we have an economic say, uh, the sign of uh, underdeveloped colonial economy is mines and plantations. We are still talking about uh, an industry which is uh, part of dirty technology, jute and steel, etc. We should have moved on. but. Let me tell you, jute is not sick. That's a created sickness. And I got into serious trouble when I gave that article in Business Standard and subsidies used to come for jute, saying this is a created sickness. And who told me that? The owner. That year he had to show his company as doing profits because he said, otherwise I'll be declared as a, a BFIR unit and therefore this year I need to do it. So I said, are you telling me that you can create a profit if you want to? He says, well, we tell the jute industry, wherever there's a bumper harvest, we tell the unions to create a strike. And uh, if there's a strike, three months of no production, the jute prices go below the normal rate. We buy it at uh, below the stated price. And then when he says this, there's a quote which goes on the telegraph, um, 
Thank you. Regards. Yours faithfully. And I said, these, these people don't know what kind of English to have so many greetings. They were different rates of commission. So that goes abroad. And then you have these people making a trip on, in the name of promoting these goods. Sell all those goods as uh, bad material. Put that in my bank account, in my personal name. So the entire sickness of jute industry. And you must be surprised now, in a time when you're talking about sustainable development, natural fibers, how can jute be sick? Plastics is out. The only reason it can be sick if you laminate it with plastic. So there's nothing called sickness. Just like Bengal is not going as badly as you think. Reason is, most of your money, your revenue score, as Shilo well mentioned, he's a person I know for more than almost 50 years, uh, is poor because most of your sales are not recorded. You have something called the informal sector. You buy a pair of Bata shoes, you pay 50 uh, GST on that. You buy a pair of uh, Hilsa fish, how much do you pay? How much do you pay for all those pigment uh, hawkers? Nothing. But that money is being collected. And therefore you can have the investment in capex because the party has the funds, the government does not have the funds. The truth is the informal sector. So you have to be learning how to digitalize them, bring them into play, and the grey market, grey economy must be broken. So unless we take these steps, unless we learn to fail our school, bring in more research, tell me what is one area of research we've done over the last 10, 20 years, which is now followed by the world. Not one. We might say we are the one, the top in the, in the country and so on, but where are you in the world ranking? Really? If you're not doing research, if you're not pushing new technology, the books we teach are all foreign books. Written, re-edited by Indian authors in bad English and circulated through the book market in College Street. So that's what's going on in the textbook. The knowledge frontiers are not our own. The textbooks are not our own. Why is plasma physics taught in IIT when there's no application of that? And that student and the teacher actually comes from abroad, the students go there. So you are creating the brain drain. This is a part of the whole story of what is going on. So unless the youth wake up and ask these basic questions, there is no love for you to stay in the city. I, we came back because we had this innate love of saying, let me get back to the country, what the country has given me. But I don't see that happening with my grandson. And I'm sure if I'm living, I'll see don't stay in the state. There's nothing happening in the state. It's far too corrupt. And it's gone up beyond our heads because we've learned to be corrupt from our school days. We've not learned what we are supposed to. We are not researching on our own front. The health has gone for a toss. We would rather go to Switzerland than to go to the beautiful uh, slopes of uh, Darjeeling or where you want to. And let's face it, as a nation, we don't really love our nation. The one we give prizes to and ask as an advisor gets the Nobel Prize and ditches the country. Firstly, I have doubts about whether he deserves the Nobel Prize. <laughs> but even if I were to grant that, because what he really said in the Nobel Prize is, you know, you measure poverty depending on what you do in that country. So poverty measures will vary with countries. Does, does that require really an insight into anything? You don't know how poverty is measured and that comes after Dr. Amutu Sen, who was our teacher, taught us there's a concept of relative poverty and uh, Kakawani and Montix and Walewale took it onto frontiers and said, I now realize your poverty will depend on the country that you're in. And, um, so these are questions which I think are, need to be looked into, but what you cannot allow is a person of our origin ditching the country and taking a foreign citizenship. For what joy? And what are you sending as a message to the rest of the citizens, to the rest of the students? Ditch your country. Can you imagine any foreigner doing that? Coming and doing his work here, going back. I've seen Mother Teresa. I've seen Father Watt who've come here and taken and given their lives here. But I cannot think of someone just for pecuniary interest going and ditching his country and saying, I'm a noble laureate, with two or three marriages behind him to justify why he's there. And he being decorated on a country for what he's done, shameful. <laughs>
Thank you, Professor Mukherjee, for a very, very candid discussion. We really enjoyed that. I think we all deserve a short tea break before we continue. So there's fresh tea outside. Let's take five minutes, refresh ourselves, and then continue the discussion. Thank you so much. Yes, yeah, so um, my name is Jayanka uh, Narayan Chaudhary. I was in the Indian Police Service. My, I, my last appointments were uh, heading the state police in Assam, and then I uh, was heading the National uh, Security Guard. I was in uh, a student of economics many, many years ago in the Delhi School of Economics. And when this topic came up, I went to some of the data. And I'm with uh, Mrs. Sumit Bos and others. I was trying to figure out how is everybody saying there's something wrong. You look at any, you look at any of the statistics. You look at any of the statistics, whether it's the growth of uh, GSDP, you look at the proportion of people below the poverty line, and you look at even, even unemployment. You, you take away the COVID years and you see where unemployment was. You look at the, the, the you look at the figure that you look at the the, the statistic that the um, that has been brought out now is called what multi-dimensional poverty index. You look at the ease of doing business. Bengal is not at the bottom. So is it just a matter of perception? You look at HDI. We're talking about HDI. You look at HDI. Where is Bengal compared to others? Is it at the bottom? No. And as uh, Mr. Bose was pointing out, people from Bengal, it's, it's, it's a resource. Human resources are, are getting jobs everywhere. And I, I, I started a pleasure with me meeting Mr. Potar, because normally a lot of industrialists say, Calcutta is a now great place to live in, but a bad place to work in. So they have the plants outside and they come back here for a weekend where they can enjoy. But he's a person obviously who lives here and lives here. So I think he's one, he's a symbol mm. of all that is good about Calcutta and, and, the, and the migrancy and the potential uh, that Calcutta has. Yes, uh, in terms of uh, when, you, when you look at the primary sector or the secondary sector, yes, it's shrinking. But you look at the tertiary sector, it's growing. And again, when you, uh, you look at MSME, we have talked about, you look at how much of, uh, how, I mean, this is one thing I couldn't figure out. In, as I said, I knew, I just looked at the numbers. Those who have some more insights, please tell me, in terms of MSA, MEs, Bengal is way up there. Bengal is way up there. So how, how are we saying that we are in the doldrums and we are way, way, MSMEs are in the doldrums. No, but no, in, in terms of, in all MSMEs are in the doldrums. In terms of employment. Right? Hmm. Yeah. Important. Now when we talk about now, now in terms of other, there are two things. One, let's look at employment and productivity. Okay. Now I look, look earlier they used to have this registered registered unemployment. I couldn't find the data anymore anyway. But the, the, the Center for Monitoring of the Indian Economy, they estimate that the rate of unemployment is about five to six percent. Which when you look at all India rates, it's not that bad. So obviously that there's a gap. Either there's a mismatch. We're not capturing the number of people, or we're not capturing the people who go out of the out of the state. But if you just look at the data, Bengal is not at the bottom. We're some, maybe somewhere in the middle, but we, Bengal is not at the bottom. Now again, you look at uh, there are, of course, very often your aspirations uh, somewhere up there, and what you achieve. Now uh, I used to look at the SEZs, SC, SC, the, the, the uh, uh, SEZs. They had. Wanted to set up 21, I believe they set up only seven. Why haven't the others set up? I think last day they announced that they make an industrial zone in Jagannath because if you look at what's available about Bengal's economy, there's a huge disparity between, say, Purulia, between North Bengal, between Howrah, Hooghly. There's a huge dis disparity between districts in terms of uh, where, where the economics are. So, um, you know, ease of doing business. You're, you're a you're from the from the United States and others. Yes, Bengal is eleven. How is Bengal eleven if things are so bad? KPMG and the World Bank did a study and they found, found that Bengal ranks eleven. Now, if it's if Bengal is way down there, as a, there's a mismatch. I, is it perception or is it what is? It? Why are we saying that Bengal is so far behind the rest of the country? Young people have a point, you, you know, you're going out, but when you go out, I mean, when I was in D school, some of the smartest people were from Calcutta. They were, they were quads. They were from the presidency and they were, they were very good at maths. 
<coughs> so if Bengal is obviously providing you some kind of a basis that when you go out, you're a star. So there's something being the state the question added. is from top you have come down, you have declined. That is the issue. You know, <laughs> you, I, I'm not looking at the 60s and 70s, I'm, I'm not looking at that period. You look at the last you look at the last five, look at the last ten years, look at the last fifteen years, I look at the last twenty years. Yes. I was looking for is there, is there some kind of a vision that the state has? Where is it going to focus? Are you going to increase the exports of IT? You have, as you said, you have individual goals and targets. There's no clear roadmap that you get where, where the state wants to go in five or six or seven different areas. Uh, Mr. Bose spoke a little bit, and so did Mr. Chatterjee, about the, 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 the debt the, that, that we have. And Mr. Bose clarified, yes, like many other states, it's higher than it should be. Maybe you're not following uh, the, the norms and so on, but it's not something that's going to pull you down. So that's uh, essentially the, 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 the picture that I get. And that's why when I listen to all the talks, the education thing, of course, like, I, 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 I get where the speakers uh, kind of uh, trying to get there, saying that you know, education, the, uh, the, the culture, Maybe it may not in terms of uh, what do you call it, the impact factor of research papers. Mm. Maybe it's not as high as it should be. Maybe there's not so much original research. Yeah, that's an area I'm not, I, I haven't read very much about, so I will not. But if you look at the data on the economy, Bengal is not at the bottom. It's not, maybe not at the top, it's not at the bottom. The, the data alone. Now, if any, anyone has data that shows otherwise, yes, let's, 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 let's bring it out here. Bring it out. So that's so far as the, uh, the uh, then uh, I, since I was from the police, let me talk about an important factor which attracts investors. Uh, the law and order situation in the state. Now, we, we spend a lot of our time in North India. Many of us spend a lot of our time in North India. Believe me, um, the rest of Bengal I'm not very uh, clear about and maybe uh, it's not, but in Calcutta at least, most of Calcutta, Women are safer. There's one, there's one parameter of safety. Women in Calcutta feel safer than Delhi. Delhi is the capital of the city, capital of the country. Are women in Delhi safe? I don't, I don't, I don't, they don't feel very safe. That's a crime capital as well. <laughs> <laughs> now, and if you look at, if you, yes, you need to invest more in the police. You know, if you look at the uh, civil police, the Thana population, and the populations, uh, Bengal is under policed. And maybe over the year, long years of, uh, you know, maybe the left rule is not, it was not considered important. It was not considered important because uh, the police perhaps were not the, uh, the, the primary instrument used to maintain order. So if you want, um, if you want uh, investors to feel comfortable here, and I'll give an example from, from as, as, as Sam. Um, it was ITC, I think. They wanted to start a paper mill in a district called Gualpara. And uh, they were wanted to invest 2,000 crores and to brought a lot of uh, employment. And like Bengal, Gualpara had, had it all. It didn't have a port, but it had a rail, uh, rail, uh, rail links, it had road links, it had river links, it had cheap labor, it had raw materials. But they were concerned about the law and order situation. You know, we promised them everything. We promised we'd open a police station there, we promised. <coughs> We deployed an entire battalion over there, but they were not convinced and they took the investment somewhere else. So yes, that is something if you want the uh, law of uh, to kind of the perception to improve, you have to invest in the police. So that's, those are the few issues that I, I uh, had and most of the others issues. As I said, listening to everybody, I really feel they feel I was out of place here because you look at the data and you think, where is it all coming from, you know? <laughs> So that, that's all I have. Thank you so much, Mr. Chaudhary. We enjoyed your comments. You know, kind of tying it back to what uh, you know, Professor Mukherjee and some of us also discussed. You know, one of the problems with the state being the politicization of everything. We talked about the police. Even the politicization of the police. You know, I you know I run a. Do you, know, do you think it's only Bengal? <coughs> no, I agree. I agree. I agree. But uh, you know, the more independence, you know, gives comfort to industrialists and all of that. But look at Maharashtra, Mumbai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, very true. <laughs> Uh, Ambassador Chakravarti, over to you. Thank you very much. I spent my life in the diplomatic service, so I am a complete stranger to Bengal. 
I left after I finished my school in St. Xavier's and came back when I retired. So, my experience is inclined towards trying to link Bengal with the region and with the rest of the world. And so, my effort is to try and see how we can firstly improve Bengal's resource base, as Shumita said, by innovative means. Maybe because only 1% of us at the moment pays tax. So we can't really raise the resources we need to be a developed country by 2047 based on the spare money of that 1%. So we need to think of innovative ways, maybe odd ways like cesses on informal activities or something something based on a trade license, whatever, to raise the resources. The second would be to see what we, our output currently is and where we can add value to that output. Value addition is important and adding value to world standards so that it becomes an exportable. Because it's the government has been looking east, but it is for the entrepreneur to actually act east. Otherwise, we'll only be looking and nothing will ever happen. So, there are many positives in Bengal. The leather industry comes after you've taken the hide off the animal. So, what do you do with the rest of the animal? I've suggested in print that we should open abattoirs in Murshidabad and Malda, export the beef across the border, because one man's meat is another man's poison. So, let people nourish themselves and whatever they please. Similarly, since Bengal is geographically blessed with all the climate zones and so on, we need to do agriculture appropriate to its zone and uh, be able to add value to it. Textiles can be improved. Uh, last week we, we had a meeting with B.B. Russell who was visiting Puglia to deal with a group of weavers and she went back crying. He said there is so much potential here but somebody has to take charge of them and tell them what to do so that he was stuck in the dark. So there is a lot of potential to improve the human resources and to do microfinancing to pr promote and recapitalize the MSMEs, of which we have some of the largest in the country, numbers in the country of the largest, and uh, try to integrate the economy of the region, what we call the BBI, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Nepal, into a single supply and value zone. Look at our own food security needs as a regional food security requirement, not stop the export volumes to Bangladesh and create more animosity for ourselves and uh, so on and so forth. I have described everything else in the paper I wrote. So I hope you will excuse me for not speaking further. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will request you to thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Shantanu Chakravarti. I teach uh, in the Department of History, Calcutta University. Uh, well, uh, since I'm also not uh, uh, an expert, particularly in economics, I will also restrict myself to some very random thoughts. Uh, while I was listening to uh, the speakers talking about uh, mis <coughs> misconceptions, uh, perceptions, misperceptions, or projections of Miss Bengal, uh, I was thinking whether it's a case of hits and misses. And when I was thinking about that, I uh, remembered that uh, famous joke uh, the, uh, <coughs> which, was a, which resulted from a conversation between Einstein and uh, Charlie Chaplin when Einstein was visiting uh, United States. You know, uh, 
uh, Einstein said to Charlie Chaplin that, uh, you know, Mr. Chaplin, I, I just love the way you project yourself. In your movies, you do not say a word, yet the people understand you and appreciate you. And Chaplin retorted back that by that account, uh, you know, you uh, are greater. I said, how come? He said, people do not even understand a line of what you write, but the world, all world over people love and appreciate you. When you talk about perceptions, uh, it's perceptions take time to grow. Uh, it's not that Bengal has a definite perception growing around the last days, uh, you know, the early years of 2000, and particularly since 2011, with the new takeover of a, uh, mm -hmm. uh, by a new political. Uh, I will just, uh, you know, uh, quote something interesting here. Kenneth Anderson, the famous uh, hunter based in Bangalore, now Bangaluru. Uh, in, back in March 1970, he was doing a survey of game reserves in India, which was still an essentially new concept. And uh, from Gujarat in Western India, he was traveling to game reserves in Assam, and he had to pass through Calcutta. And back in March 1970, he got stuck here for almost four to five days because of a wave of strikes taking place during those heady days of March 1970. And uh, as he finally managed to get the flight uh, to take him to Assam from Calcutta, I quote what Kenneth Anderson writes about Calcutta. Uh, None of us glanced earthwards at Calcutta as we left the city behind. So if this was perception of the city of Calcutta, if uh, so representative of uh, West Bengal, as all of us, uh, all of you have pointed out already, uh, it's, it, it, it's something which somehow has, st uh, has stuck with us. Now, why this is so? Uh, I'm, I'm not, not going to go, uh, go into details about economic opportunities, economic figures. Uh, 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 you know, most of you have talked about, have quoted data, and I'm sure others would do too. As we all know, we do not really have uh, scope for very large-scale industrial build-up in Bengal. Uh, sorry. Uh, and, uh, but there is a lot of potential for MSMEs, as has been pointed out. Now, very recently, I was involved in one project undertaken by Shama Prashad Mukherjee Study Cycle. As you know, a Delhi-based think tank, very close to the current ruling disposition in Delhi. Perhaps around 19, uh, around 2020-21, they were feeling very much confident that they might, they were in with a chance to, uh, they might be coming to power here. So they undertook writing a series of articles, economic databases, very, very professionally done. Uh, and I, I, in this connection, I would uh, like uh, here to talk about two of those reports which came out. One talked about, both were interesting, one talked about the connectivity, you know, Bengal's connectivity with the region, etc. But the other one was, other report was more interesting. It talked about, because uh, West Bengal is going to concentrate on MSMEs for uh, some time to come, uh, this report talked about uh, trying to go for an innovative scheme of each district, each West Bengal district specializing on one or two particular products. They identified around 28 products uh, uh, you know, with uh, you know, a district, uh, one district concentrating on one or at the most two particular products. Now, uh, there were problems involved uh, in both in the sense, uh, uh, some of these was mentioned uh, in these reports themselves. Regarding MSMEs, for instance, uh, yes, there is a lot of potential. Uh, but problem is, because of over-politicization, uh, there is a problem in, uh, in, in the sense in which uh, your economic decision-making gets hindered by over-political thinking uh, from top-down. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a, I, I will give you some examples. 
Similarly, when you talk about regional connectivity, which the other report and many other reports pointed out, yes, there is a lot of potential. We know West Bengal is a, has a very strategic position. It's so close to BBIN countries. There's a lot of potential in Indo-Bangladesh trade, etc. Uh, why you know we, we can uh, uh, talk about uh, Kolkata Kunming connection, which was so happening uh, in academic circles uh, since 1990s. Uh, is there a history? Uh, did it? Is there any example that it actually worked on ground? Actually, it did. Going back to history, uh, as you know, Calcutta was a major allied war hub during 1940s. Back in 1943, the American uh, army managed to construct an oil uh, supply line from Bajbaj here. This was constructed around 1943-44, right up to Kunming in southwest China. The idea was to supply oil to Chinese partisans fighting the Japanese there. Uh, if it could have been done in 1943-44 during the Second World War itself, there is no reason why such connectivity cannot take place now. But what are the problems? The problems are that if you look at regional border trade, I mean, I, we have heard many people saying border trade must be opened up, whatever is happening, uh, in the name of asymmetric trade, which is basically uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, non, non official trade, which is basically smuggling. Uh, if it gets government recognition, it should be okay. Problems are uh, if you look at the range of border trade, uh, first of all, uh, people engaged in illegal trade and uh, would often say that this runs in a more efficient manner rather than uh, but depending on there have been cases when local traders engaged in border trade prefer taking advantage of illegal trade networks rather than going through the government route because of immense delays and uh, corruption. Second problem is if you look at illegal trade in southeast region uh, it's essentially barter trade. Second, you have a lot of uh, you know items which are exchanged, which cannot be done in an official manner. Uh, for instance, uh, this region has huge trafficking in women and children, particularly you know through Nepal, Bhutan, uh, border districts, uh, and in other areas. You have uh, illegal smuggling in uh, drugs, small arms and light weapons, and of course in uh, items like fencing and syrup and, and other areas. Uh, you know, the solving of the problem, the Chief Mahal problem has brought it down to some extent, but it still continues. Now, if you have invested hugely in illegal trade in these items, and no, it's difficult to legalize it. I mean, no government, uh, no regional government is going to legalize trafficking in women and children, can they? Uh, the last point which I will mention is uh, overall, in spite of the economic potential, ultimately it depends on political goodwill and uh, proper administration. Are we in a position to offer them? That in this connection, I will bring you. Uh, I will uh, talk about one uh, new theory, which uh, particularly was being advanced by a uh, large number of political scientists and IR uh, experts in connection with the newly emergent Central Asian republics. They introduced a concept called neo-patrimonial state. And what was a neo-patrimonial state? I quote one uh, political scientist. A neo-patrimonial state theoretically maintains authority through personal patronage rather than through ideology or law. Just look at the examples happening all around you. Is West Bengal a case of a neo-patrimonial state? And once you uh, continue to have, uh, when, uh, as long as you continue to have a neo-patrimonial state, Whatever other sort of opportunities or potential you have, 
uh, it's really difficult to, it will be difficult for you to implement it because everything is personalized and everything is uh, privatized. Uh, to help the local political persons or the local political groups uh, who are currently functioning there. So the state doesn't get benefit and the state's integration within the federal structure also gets hampered <coughs> to a large extent. Thank you. I'd like to only pass one comment. To the best of my knowledge, though we may have the largest MSMEs, we also have the largest number of sick MSMEs in this country. Mm. And uh, we are very badly off. Same with the small scale industry. It's demonetization and COVID that really sunk us. Thank you. General, could you? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am General Shivnath Mukherjee. Uh, here, Mr. Somnath Pine told that he is a civil engineer by profession. I am also a civil engineer professional. I am from Court of Engineers and Bengal Cyprus. Working 37 years in the armed forces. I am on deputation I went as a vice chancellor of a central university at Gwalior for five and a half years. I basically, though a soldier, but uh, education is my passion and I love <clears throat> academic, academicians. I will not talk about uh, finance or thinking about the how uh, West Bengal can improve. That will be, that has already been spoken quite a bit. I will be speaking on something like that what is the biggest enemy for not only Bengal, but for the country today. Mm. And this question comes to mind often and I have been discussing with my students in the university and other places. Uh, uh, people feel that I am from army, so it may be China or Pakistan, who is the biggest enemy it has to compare, even Bangladesh as now also, or some other countries, those who are not our border, but they can influence us. So that was their feeling. Some people say it is the terrorism. Terrorists are the most dangerous thing because you cannot identify who is my enemy. They may never mind my enemy being a terrorist. But to me, it looks there are three enemies to the country, and they are corruption, yes. corruption, and corruption. There is no enemy so dangerous yes. for a developing country like us because the development, if it takes something up, it is dragged down, like we say that in a well, if somebody wants to come up, the others are pulling down. Something, something like that is happening to our country. Uh, I cannot blame anybody. We cannot blame anybody. It is us to be blamed to us that our uh, that some of us are really to be blamed, and others supporting it is also equally to blame. It is very easy in Bengal. Uh, we bask in the reflected glories of our past. Really, I don't know, the God had given at that, that particular time, the number of peoples, though were not the leaders of the state or the country, but the leaders of the world, at one point of time they came. Where are they now? Why they are not coming now? Not even one person we can say, even Professor Mukherjee mentioned, somebody who is getting Nobel Prize or Nobel Laureate, uh, he or she is going to be uh, having certain major drawbacks. But at that point of time, people didn't have that much of drawbacks. Even today, we cannot find out their what was their actual problem and what are the drawbacks in there. And I don't want to name you all, no. But uh, my feeling is, this is because we have lost our value system. We have lost the ethos which was there in us. It is lost. Who is supposed to blame? Because I am also, I have taught in College of Military in Pune for five years. I was also five and a half years as Vice Chancellor. I feel it, I feel like it is, we are not supposed to blame the teachers and those who in the primary school or something from there only. Now, 
uh, corruption has gone over our head, everything has gone over our head. We are not finding our uh, feet in the ground. So all things will fall in its place if I am still teaching MBA and MHA and I have seen, I just say that you come to the class, the attendance in the class is horrifying. People are not attending the class, what they will learn? People are very happy to have online classes, but I know behind the online classes because the videos are off and they are sleeping. <laughs> so after I read five minutes, I have to ask a question to each everybody. <laughs> sir, please repeat the question. Sir, so the parents are doing their classes. Do you know that, sir? Yeah. <laughs> parents are sitting, waiting for the class. So it is, uh, Madam, that's why I'm thinking that where we are going. Now, luckily, I got involved in this particular General Dhani Mukherjee was, I was in 15 core as a chief engineer, as a brigadier. He was the GOC there. And when I, after retirement I came, he brought me to this organization. Initially I thought that I will not be of any use because uh, how much time I can give. I am already connected with four or five organizations, including Madhya Pradesh. They are still, I am telling, remote control I cannot do. I left it many organizations where I was involved. But what I want to say, luckily here, I have got a work, though I am told that I am the executive director of the Singer Scale, but the most important work I am doing is the editor of a journal. We have a journal, which is UGC Care Listed Journal, and I uh, am the editor and doing that job. It is really a very much education from there I am getting. What type of, people say that no, English was started in class 7, 8, but when you have done post-graduation, after that you are master in some subject, and after that also your writing capability, you are not being able to express what you want to mean. Their ideas are good, but they are not being able to express. Similarly, the verbal capacity of the children, they are doing MBA and MHA, when I talk to them, they are not being able to speak out. I don't know how you face the interview. I have gone up four or five times to the highest IFS and uh, that UPSC as an external uh, uh, examiner sort of thing in the final interview. So what I want to say is that it is very much required to build up a holistic personality rather than specific bookish and what uh, uh, Professor Mukherjee told that you just run that 10, 15 question or something and then you omit there and then you forget, you don't remember that what you have uh, remember, it is not the basic understanding. So there is a basic problem. Now coming to uh, our whatever we are talking of economics and especially in West Bengal. Firstly, a lot of things have been talked about SMEs that uh, whatever is under one roof, the policy is there, that under one roof this will be clear, it will be done. But that is not being done. That is first and foremost is that has to be forcefully ensured to have a sustainable MSME that General Mukherjee has just now told that they are sick and why they are becoming sick. It is not all are the problems of individuals. There are some thing problem of the individuals because they don't know to take calculated risk. And this is what we are supposed to teach, what is a calculated risk and how you can take and work out under the uh, a paper they have got in the final year or final semester that is entrepreneurship and startup. I am taking that class, trying to make most interesting through them. But main important thing in this is that people should first accept. In Bengal, Amra Chai, Dostai, Master Kaj, Vodafuno, Vegache, Judi, Tale, Amra Kiana, Klaike, Jobe, how many people have joined, joined uh, its capital in joined in the army? And whoever has joined, SCM Raha is the, he was the chief, General Mukherjee. So there is an example, percentage of Bengalis joining, in fact they are going up, is there. So what is that? That is intelligence. So I just want to say that there is no lack of intelligence in Bengal. And they are supposed to bring the countries economically or otherwise to the top. What is lacking in them 
is a cabinet minister. I went, I should just start. But the interview may, I don't know the names. It is only on that day they will be telling that who are coming from IS and IPS and all that. Mostly are from South. And differently, we have another state where the, because we consider the politician, whatever it is, but the country is run by the bureaucrats. There is no doubt in that. And they are really uh, top notch uh, quality material. So, if that top notch quality material, how many are clearing from West Bengal and how many they are doing well? So, no intelligence is there, but people don't want to take risk. I cannot pass me, I cannot pass me, exam de dekhwa, if I fail. There is no that type of determination that I have to work. And I have to work hard to get that. And when they can make the country or Bengal uh, shape according to the, their feeling, because they have reached that level. But the president of country, Mr. Kumar, he has said that Bengal Congress has decided to take this decision. Yes. So my next question is, Mr. Kumar, uh, in fact, other points have been discussed. I will not uh, take uh, other points here. So my last point on that, I was to, I want to say that it is the teaching at home, teaching in, by the environment, and we all, we are now becoming all grandfathers. So to teach our thing, and I, I don't require to take a class at this moment, whatever I'm getting from the government by pension and everything. But it is, it is something like that, that if I can give, like when I went to as vice chancellor, I was with that aim that whatever I have learned, if I can give, and luckily that university did very well within that five and a half. So my submission it is we have to blame ourselves also if we see that they are and to tell a spade a spade it is required. If we go along with that, then uh, we are also part of the system. Thank you, Thank you, you over to you, Marshall. Good evening everyone. You know, this is the first Adda round table discussion organized by Senna's scale, which is a think tank based in Kolkata, Research Center for Eastern and Northeastern Regional Studies. Uh, and we uh, plan to hold uh, many such uh, you know, Addas in the future um, with the indulgence of all the brilliant professionals and others who are here. Uh, participate in such discussion in the future as well. Um, the topics should obviously be very contemporary and interesting ones, like the one today. Uh, you know, I am uh, uh, I have served in the Air Force and Armed Forces for nearly 42 years and retired in 2017. I have lived here for five and a half years now. Uh, <clears throat> so I have uh, learned a lot of things about West Bengal because I lived uh, 42 years outside Bengal. I studied in Sunday School of uh, So I do know uh, what was the background then, what has happened in the last 45 years. So I think everything has been spoken about this subject, and there is nothing I can add. But I will still make a few observations in the next two, three minutes' time. Yeah. OK. Uh, you know, uh, after 45 years, when I came back to Calcutta, uh, I was told by my colleagues and our friends that settled down in NCR, National Capital Region, uh, because you have a lot of facilities here, you have a lot of people here, you have a good life. So, but I disagreed with that point of view. I said, no, I'm going to go back to my roots. So he settled down there. The day I retired, I came back. And I tried to be like a normal citizen and not a PIP that was treated as the chief of the armed forces uh, for three years plus. But uh, I understood the problem of Bengal uh, as a whole problem of you know, India. Uh, West Bengal, what I knew 45 years back, I'm from a rural background, I'm son of a doctor, and we have a lot of property in the village. So we do you know, till lands for cultivation, also I know the problems there. So uh, I found those days, uh, there was no electricity. For 12 hours, the whole day, there will be load shedding. But today, when I went back to my village, there is electricity the whole day. Well, I don't know what is the reason. I believe there are no industries, so you have a lot of rental electricity. But that's fine. The population has also increased, and the demand has also increased. And the lifestyles have changed. Everybody is using an AC and things like that. Uh, second thing is that I found almost all the roads, like somebody mentioned, 
this concrete roads in the village, very good roads, much better than the roads in the city or you know, the national highways. So there are no problem. And having worked side by side, shoulder to shoulder with uh, labor we used to employ for uh, cultivating land, etc., uh, I realized uh, very hardworking people. What we talk about, you know, people in the metros, life is totally different. When you compare that with those of the people in the villages, in the rural area, extremely hardworking people. But, and in fact, uh, Bengal has so many things. I think one of the best uh, states in India, because there are so many natural resources, natural and climatological and uh, terrain-wise, uh, I would say, characteristics, which are best in the country. You have the Himalayas, you have the plains, the biggest delta, river delta in the world, the Sundarbans, you have tea gardens, you have uh, you know, so many other things. I think all types of terrain is there, a lot of uh, fertile soil, a lot of water, good rains, uh, climate is reasonably good, and you grow three crops a year. So you can support not only 11 million people that are not wrong of 11 crore. Of West Bengal, you can actually look after the food needs of uh, almost double that. So Bengal has got tremendous opportunities, and it is the link to the Northeast, and the act is policy of India to succeed. Bengal is strengthened and Northeast is simultaneous. So that is one point. That could happen. <coughs> so uh, there are a lot of positives. We need to develop some of the people have already mentioned. Tourism, huge opportunity. If we can actually develop the river banks of uh, uh, the Ganges itself, like one of the chief minister mentioned, that we'll make it like London. I hope you know, we can do that. And it'll be better than London. You'll have a lot of tourism the hills, etc. There is so much opportunity, the forests. Now, uh, second thing is that uh, you know, we need uh, MSMEs to really come up further. It's okay, it's not doing well, but we had so much opportunity in the past. We are the leading uh, you know, industry in West Bengal in terms of MSMEs and the output, industrial output, I would say. So what we need is that, uh, like the military domain, the production of defense products in Bengal was very good, very high. Before independence and post-independence, most of this, you know, uh, industries related to OMB, Ordnance Factory Board, were in Bengal. The oldest, uh, you know, uh, factory of OMB is in, in Kasipur. So you need to go and see that. It's nearly 200 years old. And the exception, exceptional, but it is, you know, is the decline is dying. So after independence, nothing grew in the northeast nor in eastern region because of I don't know what sort of policy in terms of defense industry. Now the time that we have, uh, you know, as what about the special uh, industrial zone, military industrial production you know, zone, like we have one in the south because the defense minister was in the south, and one in the you know, uh, you know UP and uh, Madhya Pradesh as well as. Uh, uh, Maharashtra area because the minister was, defense minister was from the state. But nothing in Bengal or nothing from Bengal, northeast or eastern region. So we should have an industrial corridor of that region there. So that we can really you know, bring in changes in the quality of our you know, industries in this part of the country. Bengal has declined in terms of education in the entire country for higher education and health sector. These are the two sectors I think we need to put a lot of effort so that higher education is looked after, there is no uh, uh, students, brilliant students are leaving, as we have brought out, That's because there are no opportunities to do higher studies or you know, research, etc. R&D, they are going abroad and then they are settling down there. So if you can create those opportunities here, then I think something will happen. The last point I have to highlight is that, you know, the entire country's misfortune, especially West Bengal's misfortune, is the political discourse is going only down there. If somehow we can improve that, then a lot of things will change this time. The corruption is a huge problem, and that we are seeing every day, and uh, we, we, are, we, feel very, we feel very disturbed and very you know, frustrated about the situation that is existing in Bengal and all over the country, especially in So that is one area. We have to blame because we have not participated in politics. 
as invited by a lot of powerful people to join politics and serve you know, the civil you know, society. But I realized that uh, in that environment, I am not able to win. I am a combat pilot. They can fight another you know, aircraft, combat aircraft. But I don't have the skills to fight in this environment that is there. So I declined all those offers. So that is where I think we are missing. We need to actually join politics yes. and change the uh, scope of political discourse in this country. Yes. We need to think Thank you so much, Marshall. This has been a lovely discussion. Uh, you know, everybody has had very interesting perspectives. What I do is, I maybe I take the uh, privilege of maybe sharing a couple of minutes of my own perspective, and then we can maybe do one or two questions very quickly that can be discussed. Uh, I neglected many members on this uh, uh, seminar. Told me that I neglected to introduce myself. So I am Harsh Kota, and uh, I grew up here in Bengal. And I was living abroad for many years. I did my undergrad and my master's in the US. I lived briefly in China. I've done business in many different parts of the country. And I'm a, basically a young entrepreneur. I came back and I started two companies, uh, one in the financial services space, one in the oil and gas space. And uh, my through my companies, I you know uh, I have operations in many different states of India. So I can share a little bit of my own you know personal perspectives. You know, doing business in Bengal and doing business in other states and you know just some of the challenges and uh, opportunities that one comes across. Um, you know one common theme that came across in the discussion that we all had just now, lots of you spoke about uh, you know these things. Number one is the same people of Bengal, you know the Bengalis are otherwise people from Bengal who are outside the state and they thrive, outside the state or outside the country. I mean we spoke about Nobel laureates in the field of business, people like Lakshmi Mittal etc. all from Calcutta. You know, if all of you guys, you know, most of you have, you know, spent, done very, very successful in your careers outside of Bengal and now, you know, have come back after retirement. But that's one common theme I noticed. And the second is, you know, we continuously spoke a lot about MSMEs and, you know, challenges in, you know, Bengal in the state of MSMEs. I think that is precisely the problem because MSMEs in Bengal cannot grow. You know, you, MSMEs should one day become large enterprises. You know, you, you, the objective is not to remain in MSME all your life. And I've seen small companies in other states, you know, do very well, grow and, you know, play at the national stage and some at the international stage. But very few companies who are Bengal headquartered have been able to break out of that MSM. Uh, and then a couple of challenges, you know, why that happens, you know, from my own perspective. I face a lot of challenges, you know, because my company is headquartered in Bengal, headquartered in Calcutta, do business in many different states. But uh, frankly, Bengal is not one of our better operations. You know, we don't make most of our revenue, we don't make most of our profit, growth is slow in Bengal. There's a lot of challenges. The return on effort is a lot lower in Bengal compared to you know other parts of the country. I'll, I'll share some of you know my experiences why. Uh, I think that uh, you know generally I think Bengal, the eastern part of the country, is stuck in this you know negative cycle. You know because. I mean, the economy is nothing but a cycle. It's a cycle of money moving, right? And you have to create this virtuous cycle where the environment becomes better, you become bigger in turn, your employees become richer, and, you know, fuels consumption. And, you know, you have to create this virtuous cycle. That virtuous cycle is completely missing over here. You know, one of the great inputs, uh, you know, which has transformed the economies of our country. You know, most of these startups and so many other, you know, non-tech startups also capital pouring in, you know, venture capital, private equity and all of that. Most of that pour into companies based out of Bombay or Delhi and Bangalore. Part of it, I don't know how it started, but now it's become a very good virtuous cycle for my company as I grow, I guess I go to speak to investors, uh, you know, Indian investors, foreign investors and all of that. If I am not based out of any of these three cities, and but Calcutta for them is far up, you know, it's far away. Most of them have never been to this part of the country. Because there's very few, very little things economically happening here. So they tell me if you're not based out of Bombay or Delhi NCR or Bangalore, you might as well be in Dhaka, you might be in Timbuktu. It doesn't matter. You know, we don't have an ecosystem here, we don't have people who work here, we cannot do background checks, we cannot do reference checks, we don't we don't just don't know anything about this part of the country. It's so far removed. You know, distance wise they say, okay, if you don't want to be in these three cities, you'll be in Bangalore, you'll be in Hyderabad, you'll be in Chennai, it's close by. You know, Calcutta is so far out, it's a country altogether. You know, and there's very few large cities, somebody spoke about that, around, you know, it's the only metropolis. And there's nothing else which is comparable even half its size, you know, in a very far uh, bit of the geography, you know. So that 
really kind of breaks down, you know, that virtuous cycle. So that's from an investment perspective, right? The other thing we talked about is people. You know, just productivity. The same people outside of Bengal, you know, the productivity is a lot higher, ambition is, I don't know what it is, but this virtuous cycle is kind of the same people here get stuck in this quad mind. Even now, for me, in my company, if I'm looking for a report, if I'm looking for something to get done, if I call up my manager in Ahmedabad and I say, oh, I just want this, you know, it's about 5 o'clock now, I promise you if I call that person up now, I get a report by 9 p.m. and stay in the office and he'll get it done and he'll email it to me. And if I call up someone in my cabinet office, even my senior most person, sir, what is the rush? I mean, just naturally. And it will be very hard for me. You cannot push someone every time, meaning you have to stay and you have to get there. Just the mindset. You know, the same people who come here, just the environment, you know, it changes <coughs> that same person. And that same person, you know, just everything same dropped in Bombay or, you know, Ahmedabad or Delhi or somewhere else, that person, because of the environment is like, they feel ashamed that they haven't done it because everybody else is doing it. So to create that virtuous cycle, you know, that soft aspect, because we all discussed Bengal as all the hard aspects, you know, we have resources, we have intelligence, yeah, we have everything. Uh, you know, there's nothing wrong from a hard connectivity, everything else is there. But this soft cultural aspect which kind of set in, I don't know when, in the 1960s, you know, people tell me and it continues, unless we are able to break out of that, you know, someone to light that fire in people's belly. Yes, we have to do something. Uh, you know, whatever that, we, you know, unless that happens, you know, I don't think we'll be able to break out of this chain that we are in. And how that, you know, fire is lit in people's belly, that ambition, that desire, that drive is activated, is a very, very difficult question. There's a lot of roadblocks, you know, we talked about political interference and all of that. I've seen Arana lending company, you know, almost every defaulter of ours who doesn't repay the loan, there's two things which happen, you know, we fund assets. So every stolen asset eventually finds its way into Bangladesh, so it cannot be retrieved. So, you know, that Bangladesh border is actually very, very dangerous because that is where everything stolen goes, uh, you know, without paper, then it doesn't come back. And second is every defaulter eventually joins the political party because he knows it becomes untouchable. So, if, you know, you can file a case on that, you can file a police case or whatever else, but the moment they join the political party, the police will also not come. So, every defaulter, I'm not even kidding you, every defaulter eventually joins one political party and he becomes untouchable. You have to write out that note, you cannot recover that note. You know, so that's become, you know, part of the culture. Again, the reason for that is perhaps lack of resources. You know, people faced with poverty, with lack of, not even lack of resources, lack of opportunity. You know, that same person, you know, in Gujarat, who is defaulted on the loan and he, you know, for whatever reason, they'll come and say, they'll settle. They'll say, don't let, let's not waste time, I'm losing a lot of opportunity. You know, let's finish it today, tomorrow, I have something else to do day after tomorrow in my life. Here, he'll just drag on and drag on and drag on because if he finishes that, then they have nothing else to do. So he's enjoying that fight also, you know, on a daily basis. And that's that's the sad reality of it. So that this virtuous cycle, how do we break out the fight on more? Uh, so there are some really, like, you know, practical challenges, you know, that one faces going, for, uh, you know, business over here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think it will require collective effort and I frankly don't have a very, very clear, concise answer as to what we can do to kind of break it, but I guess that's all uh, what we are here for. So, uh, I think let's, I know we are over time, but let's do one or two quick questions in case someone wants, uh, uh, you know, please. My question was, so you talk about private institutions, but many in our country don't have the opportunity to afford it. My question was, you have heard of Ashoka University. 500 crores of rupees mobilized by private people made, uh, within and outside the country. Why did they have to go to Haryana? Why not go to That is basically. See, it is creating an ecosystem. It is not solving all the problems of the country. It is not solving the... Uh, uh, there are scholarship holders there. They subsidize. They do. Uh, uh, so, why? my question is, why are we not creating an ecosystem here? Why did it go to Haryana? Haryana is not we, we think of uh, what, what you see Haryana. Haryana uh, violence against women, all, all sort of caste, everything is there. So despite that, what led Ashoka to go to Haryana rather than come to Canada? So that they could take Ramshu Mukherjee as vice chancellor. Same thing, uh, Odisha is attracting a lot of fantastic institutions. Why can't we do that? Sir, I think there are some wrong realities to be. There are so many of these university folks talking about. Most of this is one building, you know, in the middle of nowhere, it's just pretty shabby in that. Now, the vice chancellor has to run from Pillar to Post to get the act. Ground reality says that if you, as it happens in Newtown, it's like that. If you want to buy 
breaking water by cementing or do all these things and you have to get that to the local people around. Syndicate people are sitting there in places. In DLF, if you go, I don't know what, I have spoken to my friends, you know, they wanted to buy stuff. Even if you want to take, you know, vendorship of supplying water to sector five people, drinking water, you have to go to the city. And they're sitting there properly with the office and, you know, I can't. Okay? So, these universities, they do ground reality, they start to set up. We all come and put in the money. When you come to act, act together, there were so many layers of middlemen and, you know, there were so many people who take their shares. There is more violence in Haryana, there is more, as much gundaism in Haryana. Someone has come through it. Government has enabled it. So it should be possible. It, initially, it will be only a few. Do you have Adamus and Adamus? No, you, I mean, they don't compare with us. Well, let's play. I mean, we are talking about world class here. No? And, and uh, so our aspiration must be world class. We cannot be satisfied by uh, that. that. That's what I was getting at. Not that it will solve all problems. Yeah. In case of Ashoka also, it's not always as rosy as it looks. No, that's not what we are here for. Yeah. You, you know that. Yeah. We are not here to deal with the Ashoka. Very largely, private uni institutions here are no match for Ashoka. Someone has given 500 crore, some people. Of course. Whether they are against the government, for the government, what they stand for, let's forget that. Of course. Very last question. I have two personal anecdotes to share. One is this that uh, everybody is talking about moving out of Bengal. Actually, I came into Bengal, into Calcutta from Assam, from a very small town called Sitra. And I, so, Calcutta has been a great experience for me. And another thing that I would like to share, Professor Noshkar can also testify. For example, in Jalok, uh, I, I personally can say that there are a lot of talented people who can do excellent research. But we have a 25 crore uh, perhaps debt which we have to sort of, you know, overcome in the, in the future. So, I think there is not enough funding for higher education to have that kind of research. Professor Mukherjee was talking about, you know, all the second grade papers being published. So, recently I, I have written a paper which has been accepted in one, one international journal. And I had, to, I had to resort to corrupt practices because I cannot access the journal articles that are being published uh, all over the world. So, I have to copy the DOI number and do something called style now and then upload the article because my university does not have that kind of access. So this also I think uh, since many of you have, are, have, have been very successful right, in the say in your administrative qualities, I think this is something that needs to be picked up that we need to have a, correct, a proper funding in these kinds of institutions so that we, we can retain our talent. Very good point. Are we are drawing I think let's officially put the uh, seminar to an end. We can always continue our discussions yeah, yeah. Uh, offline. So thank you everyone for a wonderful discussion today. Uh, Chatham House rules, but thank you everyone. Sound of applause.